I was real excited when you said you were going to be on here. I can't thank you enough for doing it. I know, right. um, you know, you got a lot of stuff going on, but you are, I, I and we kind of talked about this at JT's, but like, um, you've always been like instrumental in my career. Like I, when you first got to, uh, the Rangers, when, when did you get, when did you first get there? When, no, when I was there, 98. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I just remember that everybody was kind of like, I don't know, I don't want to say starstruck, but they were kind of like, um, I was like, who's this dude? The guy, you know, he's like, well, number one, you're super fast, which is, you know, in the Rangers, that's like, you yeah. know, the coolest thing to be super fast. And uh, you were all, you're squared away. You were, you know, always looked sharp. You were like, um, I don't know, you were just like, you've always been, I've always admired you and looked up to you as a mentor and as nice. like an example for, to follow, you know what I mean? Like you've always yeah. like, like at that point, And then as you, you know, whenever, whatever you did, uh, it was always been a, I've always been like, that's the guy I want to be like, that's uh, my I'm role model. Uh, yeah, man. I mean, I mean, you know, just well as I did when I was a senior, I mean, I wasn't always like the stellar <laughs> troop, you know? <laughs> so, uh, it was, it was good that like guys like you and jazz, uh, were able to come in and like, kind of like mentor us and like, guide us in, in a certain way and I, yeah. I wouldn't have been anywhere for without you man so i truly appreciate everything you did for me and, oh, thank and you. uh thanks um so yeah let's um we we can start from the beginning uh you uh tell me how you got in um tell me what prompted you to to join the military and then just go from there i definitely want to hit uh, desert storm because no while everybody kind of glosses over it like it was like well we won in 100 hours and it wasn't that, it was still a big deal i mean you guys were yeah. like and we can get to it in a minute but it was, it was a big deal. It was a bigger deal than most people think. So I want to make sure we we highlight that in, in your time over there, too. So go ahead. So, yeah. So start it off. Hey, hey so so my, my cheesy piece for you, um, you know, you talk about all mentoring and all these kind of things. My um my thought when I got to the Rangers was, you know, kind of like you all. Like, who, who am I going to, you know, who's going to be my teammates? Yeah. You know, what kind of attitudes are we going to be facing? They're going to think they're better than everybody else because that's just <laughs> how we think, you know, as tech piece. But I'll tell you, having having you and, and Q and guys like that, you know, who I was supposed to be the supervisor of, like I told you, I didn't have to supervise. And I, and I think sometimes that people in, in your position at that time, you may not even understand the value you were to somebody like me because it, the dynamics change. And what I mean by that is prior to coming to the Rangers, I had to supervise. You know, you uh -huh. had your problem set of people and all this <laughs> is going to be an you know, issue and yeah, they don't like to do this. You all were completely different. Like you, what I remember about you, what stood out the most is um highly motivated, highly squared away, but also hot tempered. Oh uh, yeah. That yeah. used to stand out and it's like, man, if I can just grab him and mean, I can make him listen a little bit. He's 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 already he he's not somebody I have to supervise. You can wind him up and he can go. And just every now and again, he's a vector, you know, right or left to keep him on path. So um right. every time throughout my whole career, when I talked about the the most fulfilling job I had where I was a supervisor but didn't have to supervise, it's always the Rangers. And it was <laughs> right. always because everyone was already squared away where if it made sense when we communicated, you all would just go. So yep. yeah, you, yep. you all made my life very easy. So, <laughs> so no, the feeling is definitely mutual. And it's like you said, I, I followed you, you know, after I got out the career field, became command chief. I always kind of tracked where's JD, what's JD doing, but it always goes back to our time um, at Benning because that was a special time for me just in my career in general. For sure, me too, for sure. All right, the start, man. So, so <laughs> here we go. My um, my dad, you know, as a, as a child, my dad was in the army, so we we're always on army installations, and I kind of got the feel for this is how the army kind of operates. My brother's two years older than me. When he got out of high school, he did some reserve time for a little bit, then he joined the army. So I'm like, man, I don't, I don't know if I really care to go into the army. Right. So, so out of high school, I had a scholarship to Cameron University. So that's in Lawton, Oklahoma, because my dad was stationed at Fort Seal. Okay. So I had a, a scholarship for drawing, and it was an academic scholarship. And what that really nice. meant was every semester I had to perform at a certain level, and then the, the, you know the school would give us you know that scholarship money. Mm -hmm. But what I didn't realize at the time was it wasn't a full ride. So my parents had to, you know, subsidize, you know, that that gap. Yeah. And you know, so I'm so I'm in college for that first year. I, honestly, I didn't care for the, you know, what the professors <laughs> gave us. I didn't want to draw what they told us to draw, I just hard hit it. And so I, I my parents at the time, my dad had retired, they had both moved back to New Orleans. And so I called my parents up. I said, hey, I said, this school thing isn't working out for me. And I was only, I was about a year into us. It's not working out. I want to come home. And so, of course, your parents said, oh, yeah, come on home. You, know, you can stay with us and you can figure it out. So I go back to New Orleans. 
And I stay there for about four months and I'm like, I don't, I, I don't like this. You know, we, we were raised, my brother and I, you know, my dad always said, when you're 18, you gotta, you gotta go, you know, start life. You gotta get out of here. Right. And so now I'm 18 years old. I'm at home and I'm like, ah, I, don't, I don't care for this. And I'm working at Burger King. I'm the porter at Burger King in New Orleans. So I would come <laughs> in, I would come in at 10 o'clock at night and I, I was the only one there. I'd work from 10 at night until six in the morning. Oh. So I thought, hey, pretty cool. I'm by myself. I just clean up all the different things. And, and oh, yeah, yeah. For a minute. So I, about four months into that, I'm like, this this isn't it. <laughs> this isn't <laughs> it. So I, I go to the recruiter's office, and I don't know why I decided Air Force. Let me go to the Air Force recruiter office. So I go in there, and the guy and I were talking back and forth. He's like, well, what do you want to do in the Air Force? And, and J.D., I did not know studying. I didn't look at career fields. I had no idea. Yeah. And so, so I tell, <laughs> I tell the recruiter, I said, Hey, I said, I want to, I want to go to jump school, be airborne because my brother at the time had gone to jump school when he told me, Oh, you'll love this. We're similar in, you know, activities and things like that. He said, you'll love, you know, being airborne. So I'm like, okay. I said, recruiter, Hey, I want to, I want to go to jump school. And I said, I want to wear a beret, not <laughs> knowing at the time only few career fields kind of, you know, fit that category. Right. So while I'm in his office, he has a magazine rack and I grab the magazine rack and you, you'll probably remember this. There is a guy on this rack with camouflage and stuff. And it's an Air Force guy. It's yep. Tommy King. Yeah. Yeah. I remember that. Episode. I remember that Airman magazine. Yeah. <laughs> I have no idea who <laughs> Tommy King is, but I get it. I kind of read a little bit. I see it works with the army. They jump, you know, wherever race. And I turn the magazine to the guy I said, this is what I want to be. He says, are you sure? I'm like, that's not want to be. And so, so sure enough, man, guaranteed to, to be a TAC-P. But that's, that's really how I got into the Air Force, still not knowing and just say, oh, I want to go in the military, not the Army. Let me try this Air Force route. Yeah. yeah. So really, that, that was the, the start of my Air Force career. You right. know? And after I got out the office, about like three months later, I was in basic training. Nice. Yeah, I remember that because that, um, I we when I first came in, we were at DM, but then we would do rotations down to Panama where all those guys in that magazine were like Eric Harris and, um, Oh, uh, uh, uh Robert Sirio, I think was in yeah. there. Yeah. Um, uh, Keith Ingram, you know, guys like that. Right. So I, that, I was also exposed to that magazine early on. Yeah. It's like, that's the coolest thing. I want to do stuff like that. And that was like right after, I mean, it's like 91 when you came in it was a little yeah. earlier, but like they, that was, just a year or two after Panama. So they, they all those yeah. guys were down in Panama and getting after it. And so then um, it, it could have been too much longer after you got in the desert storm did kick off. I mean, how many, yeah. So tell us yeah. about that. Like, the, tell me about, tell me about like your first assignment and then kind of the lead up to all that stuff. Okay. So, you know, once I got in, go right to, right to tech school. And while I'm in tech school, you know, they had the five airborne school slots. And I'm like, I got to right. get one of these airborne school <laughs> slots. So I was a I was a candidate for um, to go to airborne school, go through the process, you know, and, and you know how they do the assignment piece while you're in tech school. Uh, I'm not where you're going to go to the end. They'll say yeah, hey, yeah. this is where you're, you're going. And so I, so I knew I wanted to go airborne, but then also I wanted to go to Fort Bragg and I wanted to right. go to Bragg because my brother was stationed at Bragg and I'm like, oh yeah, we could jump together and we have so much fun. <laughs> so I need to go to Fort Bragg. Uh -huh. And so, so initially my orders were to, to Fort Stewart. Okay. And then it was actually, um, Ray Carvalho, you know, Sergeant Carvalho at the time, yeah, yeah. he knew I was, um, going to be going to airborne school and he did whatever they do to get my assignment switched to, um, to Fort Bragg, you know, oh, as nice. long as I got through, um, through airborne school. So of course, get through airborne school. And then, you know, I arrived to Fort Bragg right out of tech school, or I'm sorry, right out of jump school. When I get to Fort Bragg, I decide I'm not going to stay in the barracks for the first, you know, couple of weeks. I stay with my brother because this is just going to be cool. And that's how the military works. <laughs> Did you run all this by him first? <laughs> oh, well, well, yeah. I, 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 didn't yeah okay. I, I didn't know if he was like, what are you doing? I don't know if he was like, cool. Gonna happen. He didn't tell me that now nah, you really need to stay in the barracks. Uh -huh. I got to stay with you. And so I stayed with him for, you know, a couple of weeks. He's like, where, don't they give you guys, you know, like places to stay? Or like, <laughs> I, I didn't have a car or anything. So he, he's going to work. He's dropping me off at, at it was debt one at the time, debt one, yeah. five, seventh, you know, 14th. He would drop me off at work and then he'd go to work and then he'd pick me up and he's like, Hey, don't, don't you guys, you know, and I'm like, I don't know. I'll, I'll check it out. <laughs> so I ended up, ended up getting in the barracks that way. Um, Desert Shield, Desert Storm. So while I'm at the, at debt one, I end up going to air assault school, you know, 
pretty early. And that's, you know, if, if you're doing decent things, they'll, you know, give you these carrots. Hey, we want to send you to, to air assault school. And the, the, the funny thing, J.D., and, and I think um, nowadays airmen, they do it differently, but they kind of study in advance schools they want to go to where they want to be, you know, within the career field. Man, I didn't do any of that. Any of that. I, yeah, I just yeah. showed up, you know, let's work hard and whatever happens, happens. And then luckily for me, the career field and some, some of my supervisors recognize, hey, this guy's got a little bit, let's push him. Mm -hmm. And so the first push was, was Air Assault School. And the reason I bring up Air Assault School, because that's actually where I met Angie at. Oh, okay. So, and so I, go to, <laughs> I go to Air Assault School and it has to be... It's nine. Yeah, I got I got to Fort Bragg in 89. So it's 90. It's April of 90. I go to air assault school. So I'm in air assault school and, you know, you're all highly motivated and you're thinking it's going to be a lot harder than it really is and stuff like that. <laughs> so while in school that first week, I end up going to the to the DFAC with two army guys. So I never forget this, a <laughs> staff sergeant and a buck sergeant. And I'm an A1C. And so we're in a DFAC for dinner. And, you know, we're, we're talking back and forth and Angie comes in at the time. She had been in the military a good, you know, three months or so. And so uh -huh. she's a straight up private, but she's, she gets her trade and we're all looking. She's like, man, that girl right there. <laughs> yeah. the tray. And I, I'm, I'm like, I'm going to just talk to her. And so she starts passing by and, and I stop her. Like, hey, why don't you, you know, why don't you eat with us? And she's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> like, no, come on, you know, we're for our salt school. You eat with us, blah, blah, blah. And, and the other guys are, they're on to it as well. Yeah, you know, come on and eat with us. And she keeps on saying, no, no, no. And so me, I'm like, all right. I said, check this out. I said, why don't you point at the person you want to stay here and the other two will get up and leave? And she, oh, says, yeah. Yeah, she still says not gonna do it <laughs> that's why i kept on you know putting a little bit of pressure on it and fine she points at me and man when she points at me jd i look at those army dudes i said see ya <laughs> that, that, that didn't go well but they did they got up you know they yeah. get up and they, they leave and go set someplace else so me and angie we have dinner together at defect you know and, and then we we just see each other you know throughout the time i'm at air assault school go back to fort bragg after i graduate from air assault school and now this is late april and then, of course, August, you know, August 2nd is when when um, Iraq invades Kuwait. Right. And so at the time, I don't understand the whole thing about deployments. We were on cycle and I, I got that, but I didn't understand how the deployment process worked. Sure. So, of course, we we get notification of the invasion. I'm in the barracks now. And so from the barracks, walk to work. And we're like, everybody's on lockdown, like what's going on? And they start talking about this planning to go to, to um, Iraq. And I, I'm still, I'm good. I'm like, I, oh, but I'm, I don't know how I stand on this work. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> All right, right. Well, sure enough. So, so I get called up on the second. We go in the work. Then throughout this, you know, 24 hour, 72 hour period, Hey, you got to get your bags. You got to do all these things. So I'm going through the process, getting my bags. And in my mind, I'm not, it's not registering that I'm going to deploy it. Yeah. Get our bags, go to green ramp, you know, with our vehicles and all that kind of stuff. And fast forward on the 9th of August, 1990, I am in Saudi Arabia. So we're talking like a five day window. I'm, I'm an A1C now, but what was funny to me is I remember my supervisor, Paul Gayhart. You know, they're sending us out on all these different chalks. And Gayhart tells me, hey, Aaron Lindsay, you're responsible for the vehicle. We may not fly together, but I'll see you on the other side. Okay, I'm, I'm okay with that. So I'm the only airman in this pool of Army people, of course, that's an A1C. <laughs> so sure enough, get boarded on, on a 141 with the vehicle getting to Saudi. Now I'm like, I just got to find out where, where gay hearts at, you know, once we get to Saudi. It's so, <laughs> the first place I go to is, is happens to be the division talk. Uh -huh. And I walk and I am by myself. I'm all kitted out, have all the secret stuff in briefcases. And I walk into the building and I'm just going to find an, an open office door and I'm going to find gay heart from doing this. Uh -huh. And so, <laughs> so I see the door, I go through it and there's a guy sitting down writing. And I said, excuse me, sir, can you tell me where the ALO is at? And JD, this guy looks up and all I remember seeing is stars. And I'm like, in my mind, I'm like, this is probably not good. <laughs> he, goes, <laughs> he sets his pin down. And by the time he sets his pin down, some lieutenant from another you know, door comes flying in. He's like, come on, I'll show you where he's at. So he pulls me out of the office. He says, you realize that's the division commander, General Timmons? And I'm like, 
I, I didn't know until he yeah. set up. Yeah, I realized it then. And he, <laughs> you, know, you can't just go in his office like that. I'm like, I, I understand. So, yeah, he links me up with Gay Hart. And then that whole Desert Storm, Desert Shield piece begins. And, and when, when you talk about that deployment for me, is what, what I recall is how um, everything was still bear based. I mean, I, I remember the army getting in deuce and a half and going downtown for, to get our lunch. So, you know, th- this is a, you know, a, a 30 to 45 minute trip to Hardee's is actually what they were doing. They go to Hardee's, they pack <laughs> hundreds of these doggone, you know, meals into a truck. It was a burger, a fry and a drink and they yeah. would bust it back. So you're talking about like two hours later and we would go to the back of the deuce and a half and they just throw you out a bag and, you know, grab a drink. So you're talking about, you know, um, Wilted fries, cold. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but we thought it was so good because, man, we're, we're getting hardies, you know, in Saudi Arabia. Yeah, yeah. And so we, we were, we were actually living. It was three of us, you know. We linked up once the team got together. Three of us living in a Humvee, so we stayed in the Humvee because there was no, um, there was no lodging, there were no tents, there was no tent city or anything. Oh, we man. stayed in Humvees for a couple of probably three or four weeks. We were in Humvees, and then from Humvees we moved into a huge. Um, it was an open like hangar. Okay. And we, you know, we brought a bunch of cots in, and, and I'm it's probably man four or five hundred people in there, women, men, everyone just laying in their different services. And while we were there, no latrines. And so one of our guys, the Air Force guy, made a dog on. It was a stand, a toilet seat stand where you could go and, and take it in, in you know little holes, and you yeah. you know, sit it down and you use that. But because there were so many people in this hangar everybody got sick and so it was you, you can you know what that's like oh yeah for sure so, so we're all sick and then once you know once we get out of the out of the hangar we moved to a um it was a tent we had an air force tent matter of fact i think i sent i sent a picture to you it was the um the yellow tent oh know, yeah 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 tent we moved into that tent and we stayed in that tent for probably four or five months Really? And, and, yeah, the thing about the tent, of course, you know, dirt floor, we uh, brought in some plywood, we made floors and stuff. And there were four of us that lived um, in the tent. But again, no, you know, no air, no water, oh no latrine, God. no anything. And, and because that's the really that's the first deployment, you think that's for sure. That's yes. Yep. And so and you I, guys are kind of like staging before anything kicked off and they, yeah, were they so, trying to figure so really, out what was going on or. Yeah. So, so, be, you know, the 82nd, they, as everyone would say, Hey, that that's, that's America's speed bump, you know, in case something kicks off, you got to right. we bring the 82nd in. So at the time we weren't sure what was going to happen. They just knew that they'd had to get American troops on the ground fast. And so the division, you know, came in and then it became this waiting thing of, of what are we going to do? Okay. And then over the, over the course of, you know, of this, you know, these four or five months, that's where, you know, Air Force City stood up. All the aircraft start coming in and things like that. But for a, you know, for a good August, September, I'm thinking in my mind for probably four or five months, we just stayed in one place. Kind of like, what, what, what are we going to do? You know, what, what's what's Iraq going to do and what's our response going to be? And of yeah, course, yeah. you know, I, I'd imagine now that, you know, the the. Um, the higher brass, they were planning on, on actions for us. A1C, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just here just right. doing, what I'm, doing what I'm told to do. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, so really nothing for, when did we move? We had moved from, we're on a place called Champion, Maine, and we moved from Champion, Maine, and we started heading north. I believe it was in January when we started actually, you know, moving and convoying um, further north. Okay. At that time, were you getting any intel updates about, you know, I know uh, Iraq was trying to move into Kuwait or had they already been in there and you had to go in there and liberate it, right? I mean, it was kind of like that situation. Yeah, what, what, I, remember, what I understood from that point is, is um, Iraq had occupied some areas within Kuwait. Okay. Yeah, but okay. Not, not advancing, just kind of got there and, and, and occupied. And, and then if there was, you know, I think we had two courses of action. One was if they continued to move south, we would go in, you know, and, and face them one on one and try to push them back. And then the other thing is they, if they just stayed in place, that's where we had time to build up and decide what we wanted to do, you know, in coordination with the Kuwaitis and things like that. Okay. So as you were moving north, did you get into, like, how was that? Was it, did you meet any resistance or were you, I know there's a lot of, um, as an, as an airborne unit, mm-hmm. probably not the best uh, asset to go against the tanks of the Iraqi army, yeah. but I know you guys got into it a little bit. So tell me about that. Tell me about like, actually you, you know, getting into Kuwait and seeing how that was and 
did you meet the enemy and how how did that all fold out? Yeah, for us, so we we convoyed up, of course. And, and you know, there were the, you know, the 101st was involved, a bunch of different organizations, the um the folks at the 15th Day Sash, you know, the armor teams, everyone was was involved and we did the, you know, those envelopes. We all, you know, went around and, and came in from different from different angles. And yeah. what what there's another story that I thought was pretty funny that that kind of <laughs> happened during that time. And our the biggest threat for us was the um the threat of chemi chemical munitions. Oh yeah, that's right. I was going to yeah. bring that up. Yeah. And so we, you know, we, we are trained up on, on mop and what do you do? And, and, you know, all these different things. And then we drilled like every week we would drill on, you know, we can attack, what do you do? Mm -hmm. And there was at one point we were staging this, we had moved once, you know, further North and we staged out of, I don't know if it was an airfield or where it was at. We're standing in an open bay and we, I mean, our, our chem suits are at the ready yeah. and we have found a bird, a little parakeet that we had caught. And we said, okay, if we get attacked, you know, by Kim's, we can look at the bird. If the bird, you know, dies, we know we better get it on because, you know, there's smart, <laughs> smart. Going on. So, so one night we're in our hooches and you could hear, you know, scuds being launched and you could see them being intercepted by Patriots. I mean, oh, you, wow. you could look out in the sky and you could see, you know, the bloom and you could see the interceptions going on. Jeez. <laughs> well, that one at one time, this one hits and it, it's like it's over us and everyone looks and it's JD, it's probably 12 of us in this dang open bay. But we look and we're like, I, I think we just got Kimmed. And JD, we, we look at this <laughs> doggone bird, all of us. We look at this bird and the bird just sitting there in a way we are not sure. We start throwing doggone Kim gear on. We get all Kim <laughs> up and we go back and let's let's look at the bird because the bird's going to die any second. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> so we're looking at the bird and nothing. So, so we figure out. And number, number one, the alarm didn't go off. It was just oh, us yeah. being proactive, like, hey, I think we're gonna, you know, we're getting it. So, um, that, that was one of the fun, funnier stories that kind of happened along the way. Where we're like, hey, we're gonna get kimmed at some point. Well, so, yeah, because how would you know? I mean, it, you know, with those patriots shooting down the scuds, I mean, does it like does it disperse in the air? Or does it, you know, does any of it come down? Like, you don't know. So, I mean, yeah, we didn't know. Yeah, it was, it was, it was funny. We, we all laughed about it, you know, at, at some point, but at the time it was pretty serious. Like, oh man, I think. Oh yeah. So, um, fast forward after that piece, once we actually get into into Iraq, so the things that really stood out to me in in Iraq, and we went up, you know, through Kuwait through, um, I forget the, all the names of the different cities, but where all the um, oil fields were burning and things like that mm -hmm. was really the destruction. And yeah. so I don't know if you ever heard about the, um, that six lane highway. Uh, yeah. I've heard, so I've heard the six it. lane highway is where the Iraqis were really um, escaping, you know, or getting on highway and they're just, you know, all of them are heading back North, you know, going back to wherever, but the, um, the assault that the U S and it's really the, um, you know, the, the air force and Navy Marines, even the army with helicopters, put on the Iraqi forces, man, I, you talking in your face. And, you know, by the time we get, you know, through Kuwait and start getting into Iraq, you would still see just the remains of all kinds of stuff, you know, from you know, military vehicles all blown up from, yep. I mean, bodies on the roads, you know, where, where you could tell, you could almost tell the aircraft that it, um, that it hit some of these people, you know, especially the oh, ones yeah. that were shot up with guns and things like that. But it oh, was man. just, I mean, all over the place. And so we did, well, first, no resistance, but we did capture a bunch of Iraqis. And but what was happening was when when we were, you know, getting into these different positions, they were giving themselves up. They, they, I mean, no, no fight at all. Just I'm like, I, I am done with this. But when you can just see the the um, the level of damage that the U.S. put on them in a very short amount of time, you could almost understand why. You know, oh, they, for sure. Yeah. The, the technology the training, all those kind of things. You, it was it was evident once you got into Iraq and started just kind of going, you know, through the different things. But I'm talking yeah. to say weapons, you know, let, let me leave them here. Munitions, let me leave them. All your stuff just all over the place where they just said, I'm, I'm out. So how was that getting those guys? Did you have to uh, secure them at all times or was it just like, are you flex cuff them and leave them and then somebody comes in behind you and gets them or how'd that work? Oh, yeah, flex cuffing and, and, and securing and, and how the eight second was just kind of securing them just in, in um, certain locations so they could transfer them. But um, like I said, no, no resistance at the time. We didn't have, you know, facilities set up where you could actually um, transport and move them. Oh, okay. So yeah, you guys really had facilities to take care of yourselves, let alone a yeah. bunch of Iraqi soldiers. Look, yeah, look I mean, that, you... the, the, the thing about that too, that stands out to me is just the, the, um, the accessibility 
to um, to weapons and, and things like that. And what I mean is we were finding caches of Soviet um, um, laws, you know, that they're light anti-tank weapons. I mean, we would find, it's, you know, hundreds of them all stacked up, you know, live. I mean, so, we, you know, you'd have guys who would get them and you'd, you'd mess around with them. It's like, man, these are actually, you know, live munitions that are out. We had guys who, um, you know, who would find some of the grenade fuses and things like that. So the accessibility of, of, um, of weapons. I mean, it, it was at everyone's hand. So I'm really, you know, I don't, I don't know if you go back and, you know, through history and look at how many folks were injured because of what was on the battlefield, but, but it was there, you know, I remember oh, for sure. Yep. I, I remember going through one area we're going through and there's an, there's a, a um, it was a CBU 58 um, container. So, you know, cluster bomb, you know, how the, the shell opens up and I, we roll right up on, on the actual, um, the shell where it says, see, oh you're you like, holy smoke. You know, we ended up going on um, to Lille air base, you know, we, we get out there and, you know, we're going through and, and there was a bunch of planes and things like that, that never were able to take off from, from that air base, you know, gator minefield. Those are things that you talked about, you know, you never really see it, but we actually saw, you know, gator minefield when you walk out, you're like, whoa, this is a minefield. This is what it is. So yeah. things like that always stuck to me because in training, you know, and, and when you're getting ready for competitions, you hear about those things, but you right. rarely actually see those things. Yeah. And they're always telling you like a CBU and the thing about those, they could be anywhere. So if you're walking up on the, close, on the canister, then who knows if all those bombs went off? You know, you know, I mean, gee whiz, how dangerous. There's must have been so much UXO around there. Oh, not yeah. only the caches, but yeah. just like all over the place from yeah, even or, hours, you know. So you know, yeah. I, I was able to physically see a um it wasn't exploded yet, but a um combined effect munition with the shoot, you know, with that little billet still on the back of yeah, yeah. it in the can. You're like that that's live, you know, that, that thing can blow up at any time. But it was, I mean, it really littered the the battlefield, you know, during that time. Yeah, that would be some good uh, competition study material there, just to go, just to go through there and see all that stuff, man. So, um, what ended up happening after that? Like, what uh, did you like? I know it didn't, like I said, it didn't take very long. Mm -hmm. But um, how long were, did you guys actually stay in that area before you redeployed? Yeah, I want to say we stayed in the area till till sometime was in March. And, and the reason I remember it was March. So my birthday is the fifth of March, and I'd kept a. I had a calendar and for some reason I just started jotting down what I was doing every single day while I was in um, Iraq. Smart. And on the fifth was one of the first days that it had rained. And, I, and I'm like, you know, we're, we're living in a vehicle now. And I tell the JTAC, I said, um, buddy Wilborn, he was, he was, he was a JTAC. Yeah. I was in Charlie four. And I said, hey, I said, I think I'm going to take a shower. He's like, what? I said, I'm going to take a shower. <laughs> I'm like, what do you mean you're going to take a shower? I'm like, it's raining outside. Let me go and take a shower. And so, so JD, I go out in the back of our Humvee and I get, you know, everything comes off except my jungle boots. And I, right, I, get, right. I get my soap and I, you know, I start soaping up and, you know, it's raining and everything's good. And it stops raining about midway through. Oh, no. <laughs> so, yeah, I get, you know, let me, let me get the towel and wipe all this thing, you know, soap off me now. But, um, but I, so, I, I could see that happen. I'm like, oh, it's sure enough, it's not going to stop. It's going to stop raining. Yeah. Yeah, so March, you know, March, we're still in Iraq. We came back, I want to say, um, late March. You know, okay. that's when we got back into um, into Kuwait. And then it just became a, a drill of getting your vehicles ready to to um, redeploy. Yeah. And some of the, the rules there were, you know, not not a grain of, of sand, you know, can be yeah. in your vehicle and stuff like that. So it became just a, a big drill of cleaning everything up, you know, making sure we have all of our kits so we can, you know, go back home. And we ended up getting back to Fort Bragg sometime in April. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, March sounds about right because I came in in March of 91. And, uh, you know, we were all like, I was on the delayed enlistment program for a couple of months and I was watching, you know, CNN every day. Like, oh man, what did I get myself into? And then uh, it did ended before, I, like when I was in tech school, the whole thing ended. So, yeah. So you redeploy. You're still at the 14th or debt one at that time. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, go from there. Tell me, uh, what'd you do after that? Yeah. Yeah. So, so from there, I mean, I, I started, I started to have aspirations to do other things within the career field. You know, by this time, um, Lundquist shows up okay. to the 14th, you know, a lot of respect for Lunk yeah. and then, then some other folks. And oh, real quick, Lunk was down and he was stationed in Panama when I was down there. So, like, yeah, I, I met Lunk early on in my career. Yeah. Okay. Good influence. Good. Really yeah. Good, influence. Yeah, good, sure. good mentor. Yep. So guys like him start showing up at the 14th, you know, so from from 91 till about 
I think about 90, well, it's only about a, probably about a year and a half period there. I ended up going to, to free fall school. You know, I ended up going to, um, to jump master school and, and really going to free fall school. That was not in my list of things to do. Yeah. I was going to say <laughs> at that point in your career at that early, like that's a, that's a gift. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and, and really it was, um, chief Reese, McReese. Okay. He had, um, his policy was you couldn't go to any schools if you were on DRB. Okay. Even if it was a local school, you couldn't go. Like, yeah. Right. yeah. So sense. during that, that window, I'd miss going to, um, jump master school. And, and then, then a month later, someone from the 14th goes to jump master school on DRB. And so, so, uh, chief Reese is like, yep, Kenny, we, we missed that one. You know, we'll, we'll make it up, you know, some kind of way. And I'm like, all right. Uh-huh. And didn't think much about it. Well, the makeup was free fall school. That's a pretty good so, makeup. Yeah. <laughs> so, so when it happens, I come into work one morning and Doug Tillman, that came to the squad. Remember, he was an instructor. Mm-hmm. Doug comes to the squadron and he says, Hey, there's a fallout slot. You know, it's for tomorrow. And, and do you have anyone to fill it? So, so Rick Reese comes to me and says, Hey, you want to go to free fall school? And I'm like, Oh, I got to think about this one. I'm not sure. He's like, <laughs> You're not sure. I'm like, I don't, I don't know if I want a free fall. And he said, Why do you know tomorrow? Or I need to know today because school starts tomorrow. And I'm like, Oh, man, I don't know about this. You know, um, I don't it know. is a different animal like that, you know, air assault, <laughs> pathfinder, airborne. Those are all kind of like army schools and they're like, yeah. kind of understand it. But free fall was like that it's next different. level. Like, That's what different. am I doing? Like nobody's it's pulling my shoe for me. And nothing like that. You're like, I don't know about this. And then so yeah. he, um, he said, all right, just let me know. And, and then yeah, I think because being at the 14th or debt one peer pressure, you know, everyone wants to do it. I'm like, yeah, let me, let me go ahead and do this. Yeah. I'll, I'll, and so, yes, yeah, sure enough. The next oh, day, you got killed by everybody. If you didn't go, if you oh, yeah. been like, oh, yeah. what, what are you doing? <laughs> well, so I end up going to, going to free fall school, get back from free fall school. Lunk and I have a, a rotation at NTC. And so we go to NTC. We're with the 82nd and we're, you know, everything's on foot and it's in the yeah. summertime. And what, what I recall about that rotation is one day, man, it, it's probably, it's probably two or three o'clock in the afternoon. And how the 82nd was doing is you would basically sleep in the daytime. You do your operations at night mm-hmm. and, you know, we're on foot. So Lunk and I are under this, you know, desert shade and JD, it was probably, it was probably four foot wide by about five foot long. And you had to prop it up and get under it. So, so Lunk and I are probably an inch away from each other trying to go to sleep. And it's just, you know, we're turning like, this is not cool. Probably hot. So <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. burning up hot. And so the rotation goes really well. We do a lot of good stuff at the rotation. But the sergeant major from the 82nd, he approaches us and he says, hey, he says, um, you know, love what you guys did here at, at NTC. Have you ever considered going to ranger school? And, and nope, not my thing. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to ranger school. I'm from the city. I'm not going and, you know, <laughs> being in the woods for, you know, 72 days. And right. lots of, oh, Kenny, come on, man. He says, you know, you're already in shape. It'll be easy. You know, we can go together. And I'm like, no, nah, I don't want to do that, man. And so, so our major says, well, just, he says, you guys let me know. I'll send you to the eight seconds pre-ranger course, and I will pay for you all to go to ranger school. Because, wow. you, know, you know, how the schools work, you know, yeah, yeah. you want to go on your own, the Air Force has to pay. So he throws that out there. And I'm telling Lunk, like, I don't want to do it, man. <laughs> and then so, so Lunk did some prying and some prodding. And, and sure enough, um, ended up going to, to ranger school, you know, because of Lunk gave me that little nudge. And so our major said, hey, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll get you guys. So, so after I did got you guys end up going together or oh, so no, so check here you go. Here's a story you never heard. Oh, yeah. So, so we go to pre ranger together, mm-hmm. and I knew all the different things the PT test, you know, the pull ups, the swim test, all those things. So, JD, it's time for the 15 meter swim, you know, and you're in, you know, in all your gear, your LB, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. And I hop in the water, you know, I, and I bring my weapon up and I can't move. And I'm like, I don't know what's going on. So I start sinking, you know, and I'm trying to bring myself back up and I'm yeah. sinking until the instructor, you know, they hook me and bring me up. They're like, Hey, you got one more time Ranger. And I'm like, what's going on? I can swim. Like, I don't get it. Yeah. And so I get no water again. And the same thing happens. They pull me out and say, yep, you're a no go. You gotta, you know, you're, you're out of here. You come back no when you can figure out how to swim. So, so I'm leaving long hanging now. And what, what I, what I remembered was I had never, trained to swim in full uniform boots you know oh, okay. yeah. and, and so, so i end up training for the next month where i'd go in a pool with all my stuff on and do it i'm like okay i know there's there's a way to do it sure, sure. So, so yeah once i learned how to do that I, I was okay so lunk ended up going to to ranger school 
without me, you know, and he got through the first time and he, he came back as a graduate. I wasn't even in Ranger school yet. Now I'm like, God, Lee, I wish I would. <laughs> now you get, yeah. yeah. So, you know, good thing. It's, it's a tough thing if you've never done it before. Cause you, like you said, it's not, the dynamics are a little different when yeah. you have boots on and, and like full BDUs and, and an LCE. And I mean, that's, it's a lot of gear to mess around. Yeah, I could understand how. And my whole thing was I know how to swim, so I didn't. I didn't right, exactly. The train, you know. Like, oh, you, need, yeah. you need to at least try to see what it feels like. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so get through, for sure. Yep. So I get through Ranger School, and at the time, this is this is ninety four. I graduated Ranger School ninety five, but not ninety four ish is when the the tack piece stood up the twenty second ASOF, which is where we already had tack piece that were supporting the um, you know special forces. That was Doug mm-hmm. Tillman and and Gary Jones and, and those kinds of guys. But they they did it in a way this time where they're going to stand up stand up a flight that was dedicated to the different groups within you know special forces. Yep. And so I um, I applied for that and I ended up getting selected to go to the twenty second and. Nice. You know, got done with Ranger School, right from Ranger School, go right to the 22nd. And I was I was the uh, the TACP for 3rd Special Forces Group or the ETAC okay. time for 3rd Special Forces Group. And what we would do with those guys initially was we would we would actually train them on emergency cast. But we were also the the folks who did closer support for any of the companies within the uh, Special Forces Groups or any of the teams. So did, did a lot of um, TDYs and things where we'd go out and we'd do air, you know, air and stuff like that. Um, really, really good assignment. You know, yeah. and, and what. So so I have a story based on my time with the SF guys and then my time with the Rangers. And I yeah. think my I think my timing was was off. You'd under, you'll understand it once once I tell you about it. But I didn't realize that my timing was off, you know. But but now, you know, as I get older and more mature, like, I, it makes sense now that I was frustrated in, you know, sometimes with special forces guys and not with the Rangers. Right. Right. So. So we do that piece, man, having a, a great time. <clears throat> Angie gets hit with orders to Korea. And I'm like, no, we, 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 can't, go to, we can't go to Korea. What are, we, what are we doing? We can't do this. But, you know, the, the army's like, no, she, she needs to go to Korea. And for the for the family, it was best if if we both went. Yeah. You know, to Korea. Because you can stay two years and bring the kids and all that. Yeah. So so we lucked up, man. We both went for one year. <clears throat> oh, right on. We went for one year. And um, she was in Yongsan and I was at um, at Camp Casey. So okay. we ended up flying over together. We did our, our mid tours together. And then we came back, you know, at the same time. Our um our kids were with our, were our in-laws in Alabama. Oh. So, you know, they stayed there for the year. But that that probably worked out in our favor because Angie had a had a um guaranteed assignment back to Fort Benning. Nice. And so it, you know, of course, joint joint spouse and everything. I was already ranger qualified. I, I you know, I fit the bill. It made yeah. sense. So I was, you know, I was really happy about that, that we could, you know, do career for the year and then come back to Fort Benning. Yeah. 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 You, that was, Oh yeah. That was a perfect fit. I mean, that was uh, it, yeah, it did really work out. Yeah. When you came in, like I said before, it was like, it, we were, we were already, we were doing well, you know, you know how it is when people are there. But then when you came in, it was like, I got to step up my game, man. This guy is so scored away. I was like, I gotta, I gotta start, you know, I don't know what I did uh, as far as like pressing my uniforms or, you know, being doing PT, but I know when you came in, I amped it up a little bit. I mean, at yeah. least, you know, if, if not more than that, cause I was, I was like, I gotta, I got to get at least stay with this guy or impress him or something, man. I was like, so I mean, I stroked you enough, but you know, you know, that like you're one of my, one of the an instrumental people in my, you know, whatever successes I've had that you were instrumental in, yeah, in getting me there. So, you. yeah. So you were there, you got there around 98. Yeah. And, January 98. Yep. Yeah. We used to do, we were doing, I, you sent that picture of, uh, of, uh, Kronk. We, we <laughs> taped him up at the end for, is that Pickett or, uh, that was picking where that yeah, was it for yeah, picket. Yeah. Uh, and then, yeah, we, I remember, and I was talking to somebody about this, but, uh, or maybe we, you and I were talking about it, JT's, but, uh, we would drive all over the country just doing cast. We drive to North Carolina, we would drive to Florida. We, I mean, we drove, yeah. Benning was just so lo- centrally located with all those ranges. We were just all over the place. Yeah. And, uh, we spent so much time like in vans or in a six pack or something just driving all over the place. I thought that, but that was like, I thought it was a pretty good time because not only was it a fun time, but it was a good time to learn too, because like we were talking, kind of talking about before when we go on these cast trips, it was just, I mean, you call it brutal, but it was just like total honesty on how you did, you know, yeah. that feed, you guys provide that feedback to us. And I'm like, yeah, that's right. And you, and it would just stick with you and you just grow that much better at, at the yeah. job, you know? And I, I'll tell you what stood out to me at, at um, Benning, 
was it felt like, and I know at, at other assignments, you're doing the same thing, but you're a little bit closer at Fort Benning. It felt like we were training to do the mission. And, and that that's why the scrutiny, that's why you have to get it right. That's why your poncho's in the wrong pocket, all, all those kind of things, because because it really felt like we're doing this for a reason. Yeah. You know, and that, that's what that's what I like the most about that assignment is, is you felt like at least I felt like I was having an impact on what the United States was doing. Sure. And, and there was really no other um, assignment that I had besides that, you know, Desert Shield, Desert Storm. But no other assignment I, I had where I really felt like if something happens, we might have to leave. Right. Yeah. And because there was already that precedent set in 93. They went you know, to right. Somalia and then and that was third bet. So, I mean, it, it's yeah. right in our back. That was who we supported. And uh, so, yeah, it just seemed like if anybody was going to do anything, it was going to be us. Like, we better yeah. be ready. And, and they were all, you know, in between that and like the time we were there, there was, you know, hints of like, you know, some rumblings and I think it was like Montenegro or something like that. But then it ended up being, and then when 2001 rolled around, <laughs> that's when it like it all, it, it came to fruition. Like it, all that training paid off. That's right. um, you, I remember, I think, I think I was already in when the towers went down or when the, when the plane first hit, yep. but I think you guys were all stuck coming into base or something. We're driving in, yeah. We're driving into base. Yeah. Yeah. And Benny yeah. was just a, just a parking lot at that point. Yeah. Yeah. And the um, thing about that is, is we, I mean, we knew, you know, yeah. when like this is this is not going to be good, you know, everyone right. knew what's going on. But again, that's why hey, this is real now. Yeah, this is real. And I'm not sure you remember we had, we had to go to Fort Bragg to. Did you go with us? I think I don't think I did because Sean Dean was talking about that. A bunch of guys went to Bragg oh, to plan. Yeah, I think I don't think I actually went to that. I think you guys went because yeah. we planners, you know. So yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't. Of course, I'm not going to get into details about that. But that's where I really. That's where I knew, yeah. you know, <laughs> hey, this this is for real. Yeah. I mean, the the level of leadership that was involved and in some of the things that were being said, you know, you're just like, holy smoke, like this is that this is an American democracy right here. This this is right. what the response is. I mean, so just, you know, be, being a part of that and understanding what we we're going to do and why we were going to do it. It's like, OK, yeah, you know, well, then, I, I opening back, for you, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. And then getting back and it's like, hey, it's time to go. <laughs> so um and we all kind of went different ways um mm -hmm. like uh you know we went to the island and then but tell me about your part like i i know kind of what you did um but i don't think we ever sat down and talked about exactly yeah. how that experience went so yeah, yeah. talk me through that so, so I'm, I'm gonna back up for a second because i always think okay. it's important when military people talk um family and, and what i mean by that is is um at the time kenneth was five years old yeah and, you know, every time we, we went someplace, we were in civilian clothes first, you know, you're driving in civilian clothes and you got to, you know, do whatever. And so I'm I'm laying on the couch. This is the, the same day that we're going to we're going to leave. I'm on the couch and Kenneth's laying on my chest and my chest starts getting wet. And I'm like, what's going on? So I lift him up and he and I, we were real tight. I mean, played together, and you know, always box around and stuff. But I raise him up and I said, what's going on? He says, "Um, every time something happens, you leave and I don't like it. I'm like, whoa, he goes, he goes, I know that those, I know what happened in New York with those planes. And I know you got to go to Afghanistan. And man, I'm just like, because I'm, I'm, I'm trying to process five years old. How does all this make sense to you? And so when he tells me that I go in there, Angie's in the room and I go in there and I said, did you hear what Kenneth just said? She's like, yeah, I, I did. And, you know, she's in the army. So I'm like, you, you understand because you know, because you're in the army. And um, I said, what do you think about that? You know, as far as, you know, every time something happens, I leave. And she says, I think it's true. And I'm like, eee. And I'm like, so <laughs> why haven't you ever said anything about it? And she says, because I know that's what you like to do. And, and so what, what, what that made me think about is as a TACP, you know, and then that could be a person who was a previous TACP, someone who's currently a TACP. Every now and again, we, we neglect our family and we believe they you know we'll I've, I've heard it oh i've talked to my girlfriend i talked to my wife she's good with it yeah she, she's good with it but you really she really doesn't understand what she signs up for when they say yeah, i'm good with it right. and, and because kenneth told me that that's where it really made me say man this is this is different because at his age he shouldn't be feeling this kind of way Right. You know, and Angie, because that's what I like to do that. She just, you know, supported me the whole time when I'm thinking everything's good. You know, she supports you. She's great with it. Nah, not really. Yeah. yeah. So um, so that that's the family piece. I think that had I had I messed it up for too much longer, we'd have probably got a divorce. Oh, really? Because I was 
I, I actually I was selfish, but I didn't know I was selfish. Uh, well, none of us do. I mean, you're right. None of us. None of us have that feeling because we we have that drive to like do this, the good stuff for our country, right? So yeah. we we feel like we're warriors. We feel like we're patriots, but then we forget there's like other people that have to we have to drag along with us, and then you right. know it's tough on them. Yeah, yeah. and it, you're right. It, it if nothing else, you should address it, like you were saying. Like you should at least acknowledge it and be like, look, I hear, I feel you, and you know. And just talk it out or, or something. But a lot of us, a lot of us don't do that. We just kind of yeah. ignore it and be like, suck it up. I'm out of here, you know, and then. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's, that's exactly what her and I did. And I told her before I left, I said, from now on, whenever I have to PCS or get another assignment, I want your input. Because what I realized, J.D., before that, every place we went, it was about me. Yeah. Hey, I got to go here. You got can you get orders there? Hey, we got to do this next. Hey, if we go to Korea, we got to go to Fort Benning. You know, all, all that kind of stuff is what I was telling her. And she was just following. It was right. never a thing of, hey, I have an opportunity to go to these three places. Which one works for you? It was never that. Yeah, it was, this is this is what we have to do. So um, so really, I you know, it took Kenneth to, to open my eyes and say, hey, you're kind of messing this one up, Dad. I, so, I hope people hear this and, and take that to heart because there are there. I, I feel there's probably a lot of relationships that could have stayed together or, you know, at least healed it. Like you, like you guys said, when we talked earlier, I was, I was, um, you know, kind of praising you for, for lasting so long and uh, yeah. you're a very good uh, model for others to follow. And you said something like, well, it takes a little work, you know, and, um, yeah. and that's, that's the work right there. You know, you have to communicate right. and, you know, you have to be, you can't be selfish like you were saying. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that was my, that was my wake up call before that deployment. My promise to Angie was, Hey, as long as we're in the military together, we will, talk about assignments. We'll do things together. It's not going to be me by myself and you just follow because that's what you should do. So um, that, that, that helped us, you know, tremendously. And, you know, and, and then the, my, my um, responsibility was to stick to that. Yep. So, so yeah. So, um, so, so Afghanistan, like you said, we all went our, our separate ways. I was on the, I was on a Kitty Hawk. So me and Del Pego. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. We get to the Kitty Hawk. What I didn't realize at the time is you had to be on a, on a ship for a certain amount of time before you can get off a ship and do operation, you know, the whole sea legs thing. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> think that was such a thing, but it actually was. So, um, so yeah, we caught a helicopter out to the, um, to the Kitty Hawk. They put us in a, in a, um, the birthing area or their little building area, you know, we're kind of off, off to ourselves, you know, doing stuff. And we were on reverse cycle where we're, you know, sleeping in the daytime, you know, you know, trying to stay up at night. What was yeah. funny though, is they were doing, they were doing their, um, their airfield operations or carrier operations during the daytime. And they put us right underneath the, um, Oh, geez. Yeah, so, <laughs> so you'd hear the, you know, pow, you'd hear the dog going, you know, look, look, all the thing, you know, bindings going and things like that. So it's like, you can't sleep in here. And oh, so I, I, I always thought that was kind of funny where, where they um, put us at. And probably, you know, I guess if you're in the Navy, you're used to it. It doesn't, you know, doesn't sure. keep you awake or things like that. So right. uh, yeah, we, we did that. Not a whole lot of, we, we had a couple of meetings on the ship. We, we knew what we were doing. We didn't know when we were doing it, you know, at the time because they, you know, the moon phase and, and all that kind of stuff. So um, really for Del Pego and I, man, all we did was, you know, we ate and we worked out, you know, yeah. we, we worked out every single day and, you know, and running on a, that, that's, that's actually where I learned to run on a treadmill. Oh yeah. Because the, the ship was so tight, you didn't have a, a long enough area where you could, you know, really get in, you know, some good distance. Right. And so I'm like, all right, I guess we'll, we'll do this whole treadmill thing. And what I've learned about the treadmill is it overlooked the, the hangar deck. But because they left the hangar deck, um, you know, bays open, all that seawater would be on a treadmill before you initially started running. <laughs> so, so, so it would be slick for, you know, probably the first quarter mile where you got to watch how you step and stuff like that. And then it would dry up, you know, a, as you went. But yeah. You, you could look out and you could see the ship, you know, kind of rocking back and forth That's crazy how, how was that on the treadmill like with it with the horizon you you know, moving? It. it was weird you got used to it yeah yeah you, you really got used to it i mean i don't know if you just focused on something different but you know you got you got used to it and that was my first time no jokes and hey i gotta run on a treadmill because i can't run anywhere else and, and i, I yeah. needed to run sure, and so, sure. yeah, so we do that for man when did we i forget when we even got to the ship okay it's only, it only a couple of weeks before we got off the ship to go and do stuff Okay. So, um, but, you know, but we're on the ship for almost the whole the whole month of, of doing, you know, the, the working out and, and, you know, getting off the ship and stuff like that. So um, we do. I do. I, you know, get get off the ship to go and do a couple of the operations. If you remember, 
the U.S. was doing those conditioning flights. Yeah. And so, yeah, yep. that's where they were, you know, flying around, going into Pakistan, going up to the border of Afghanistan to really get people used to seeing, you know, U.S. helicopters kind of flying around and stuff like that. And, yeah, I, and I'll tell you, you know, we had to stop doing those because <laughs> it was it was dangerous. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, yeah, they're, 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 you want to condition the people, too, but you're also like, out yeah, there, it was, it was not good. to the enemy, too. Yeah, it was not good. Like, we got to stop doing these conditions flight for some get shot down. <laughs> so um, the mission that I was on, you know, not all the details of it, but anyhow, you know, we we um, well, I'm going to back up. The, the okay. launch from the ship, that's something that that um will stay cemented in my mind for the rest of my life. And, and the reason why is because, you know, you talk about the, the planning phase of Fort Bragg and you're kind of watching stuff as it pans out. And, and what I recall the night that we're going to launch is is waves of people getting onto the um, the elevators that bring the, you know, the aircraft to the top. Oh, yeah. yeah. But what, waves of troops getting on the elevators. And, you know, turning back in, facing the hangar deck as they're going up, you know, but the first couple of waves of, of troops that get onto the elevators, you know, they, they turn around and all, all kitted out, C4, all kinds of stuff. But, you know, every person, you know, to a point has on a, a fire department hat, a police department hat, World Trade Center hat. And it's, it just the feeling, man, was, oh, it's, it's on. It, it is on right now. And I'm um, just the the seriousness, the focus of everyone, you know, who's who's getting on those you know, on the um, elevators to go up. So when it's when it's our turn to get up to get onto the um the elevator, I remember getting on, and I was assigned to one of the um one of the Blackhawks. So we had a bunch, you know, Blackhawks and Chinooks that are on the um the deck. Get on the elevator, go up. Props are already going on a helicopter. You just run into your assigned, you know, chalks. And I'm with the I'm with the FSO and and um maybe the company commander. I, I'll always be like you know the fire support package. Yep. And then I I, I um had. 18s, F-18s, F-15s, and some other um, aircraft that I was, you know, kind of controlled in. But what I remember is once we got to the to the actual um, flight deck, I'm running out to my helicopter, and you know, and moon is low. But what I recall seeing is the the flash on the helicopter, and the first flash that I look at, I see a silhouette of the World Trade Center painted. And it's like, wow. hey, you know, like that, that's that's cool. And then, you know, you kind of glance over, you look at the other, you know, helicopter and you see United Flight 93, oh, you know, man. American flight, you know, so, so all yeah. everything was represented on those helicopters. And it's like, man, like and, and it, almost like you you want to pause and I, I got to capture this, you know, but there's and, yeah. there's no cameras. There's no, you know, no phones and things like that. But you almost want to pause and say, man, I, I got to take all this in because this is this is in response to what happened, right? You know, so so we, we get onto our um, our helicopters and we launch, and I, I think it was it was anywhere a four to six hour flight to to go to where we're at. We oh my go. god, I forgot about that. That's a long <laughs> flight, man. That is a long <laughs> flight. Yeah, and, and then some of the I, I kind of laughed about some of the um, the rules of engagement. If like if a helicopter got shot down, I mean, you know, they're they're huge on Black Hawk down and what happened and how do you mm -hmm. retrieve people. And, and what I do remember is, hey, if your helicopter goes down, depending on where you're at, if, if another helicopter can't land to pick you up, you're going to E and E back to the water. And it's like, <laughs> man, that, that could be 100 kilometers. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so, yeah. So, so just the, um, <laughs> the, the distance and things like that. But that, that was no joke. That was the plan. It wasn't, hey, this is not reasonable or, or are we serious? It was like, no, this is what's going to happen. No way. And it's not even like because Afghanistan is not on the water, so you right. like go through a different pl different country to get there too. <laughs> yeah, but that that Jeez. was the plan, man. And now when I think about it, now I'm like, holy smoke! And everyone's good with it. You know, everyone's good. Like, yep. All right. It's yeah. If this thing goes down, you know, if if no one can land and get you, you need to start heading, you know, back to the water. It's like, okay, kidding everybody. All right. <laughs> yeah. So um, let's make sure there's an HLZ. Just to, you know, <laughs> let's make sure they can land. So, uh, so going in, man, the, the only, um, the only activity was just pre-assault fires. Yeah. So, so nothing, you know, nothing, um, face to face or, or things like that. Everything's pre-assault to really just, you know, prep the objective to go and do what, what people really ha had to do 
So yeah. I'm in control of those pre-assault fires, hearing everything that's going on, knowing that, you know, hey, dude, we're good, we're successful, and, and you know, it, the operation should go off without a, without a hitch. Um, the, the other thing that stood out to me, though, is the the Navy launching some of their um, stuff out the water. Okay. Tomahawks and stuff, you know, and it's like. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, especially when you see them. <laughs> yeah. This is neat, you know. So, and then for me, I think the whole time, as things are going on, because I have a timeline and a schedule in my mind, because I was a part of the planning, you can see things as it's coming together mm-hmm. you know, in real time now. Yeah. yeah. You know, like, okay, this is what we're doing. Okay. There's a jump that's going on. That's going to be, you know, televised by CNN, but it's not a CNN. <laughs> right. <movie. laughs> so so you know, all those things are going on at, at certain times. Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah. So, so just really, I mean, it just is cool and amazing to see and be a part of. And, and then uh, also significant for me, is when we get back from from an operation, we got back. I forget what time in the morning we get back to the ship. But if you remember, we um we lost two of our, our Ranger buddies, you know, yep. that night. So Stone Cipher and Edmonds are, are their right. names. And before we had um before we launched, everyone had to go and write you know letters to their loved ones. Mm-hmm. And, and you know we we gave it to the to the company and, and they did whatever with them. So we write we write those letters and. Of course, when we get back, we, we find out that we've lost two of our, our rangers. And Edmonds had, I want to say, two girls, and he, he was married. So he, he was older. He was 20, in his, in his early 20s. So his letter was really to his to his wife and to his kids and to his family. Right. Well, Stone Cipher was a 19-year-old PFC. He had, you know, had just gotten to the rangers, you know, very young, you know, smart, just, you know, would do anything for you. Well, yeah. this guy had the wherewithal to in his letter to say he you know he wasn't married, you know, no girlfriend, just you know, mom. But he had the wherewithal to say that if if something happens to me, and I'm paraphrasing, if something happens to me tonight, I want my ranger buddies to have a beer on me. Wow. And and so what he knew was in the Arabian Sea, you know, the rules are you you can't have you know alcohol in those territories. Oh yeah, yeah, that's right. And so so when when the um when the officer read his letter to the to the um company. They said, hey, since this is what Stone Cipher wanted, this is exactly what we're going to do. And, J.D., they pull this tarp off this crate, man, and it's nothing but Guinness. <laughs> and they said, we want you to have a beer on Stone Cipher. Oh, man. It was, it was so cool because you understood that, hey, we this we can't do this. Yeah. And, and then the U.S. said, no, in this circumstance, we're going to do it. Yeah. And then if you remember, this is, you know, the U.S. hadn't declared anything against you know afghanistan and, and oh right so so how do you how do you categorize their death yeah you know, exactly what, what is it and that's why even now if you go into the um the archives and try to look for you know the first you know people who died in in um oef or in afghanistan it's very hard to find their names yeah because yeah. you were because nobody knew we were there in the first place so yeah, right. yeah exactly yeah yeah Man, that's I, that's one thing I loved about the Rangers, dude. It was like it, it was so by the book and straight laced until <laughs> it, it made sense not to be. You know what I mean? It, yeah, yeah. It, it was like yeah, well, yeah. This is what's happening, and that's it. And it all made sense, and it wasn't. You know, I was just yeah. That's what a what a powerful moment. Yeah, you got to experience. Yeah, and that's nothing I was gonna say. Like when you were talking about like the World Trade Center and the helicopters, and like right now we can kind of talk about it. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like what twenty some years ago. So. Now we can kind of talk about it like this, but back then we were all like, it was right there in the front of our heads and we're right. like very, very motivated and very angry. And we were like, yeah, we're take it. yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. And it was like, and those reminders uh, just solidified that, that rage even more, you know, I, right. I mean, I was like, I remember all of us, you guys and all of us were just, we couldn't wait to get there and do something like, right. you know? Yeah. So, and that's what it was. I think controlled rage, it controlled yeah. anger. Like, man, this, yeah, this is not cool. And, you know, we're going to do something about it. Yeah. And I think that was the that was the motivation for us on the ships. Like, oh, no. You know, when when yeah. you sit in a brief and, you know, you, you got a commander briefing that saying, hey, you know, Mr. President, none of my guys are going to get killed tonight and we're ready to go. <laughs> yeah. like, oh, OK, <laughs> we're, we're good with that, you know. Exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So you um you did your missions out there and then you, you left, uh, you, you didn't, remember, you left- yeah, I left early because I was, I was, I was PCS and I had orders. Right. Right. That's right. I remember you let, and I was like, I, I kind of getting back to what you're talking about with Angie. Mm-hmm. I felt bad for you. I was like, Oh man, he's going to miss out on all this cool <laughs> stuff. But then I'm like, but then now after having, you know, hearing your story with Angie, 
it all made sense because like mm-hmm. you had done your thing and now it's time to you know move on to a new, a new thing and you know and like you said to like kind of get angie involved and you know yeah. um yeah, so go ahead. I, I don't mean to steal your thunder. Oh, no, no. I, I just, I mean, I, honestly, for for being in that unit during that time, I wish we were, were at Benning for like another two years. Yeah. It's just timing wise. My four years is up. The army is like, hey, she needs to go overseas. Hadn't had it overseas right. long. And then, we, you know, we had the orders, you know, before everything had kicked off anyways. Yeah. yeah, yep. Just like, That's man, right. you know, the timing is not great here. So, yeah. I so know. I, I was yeah. like, darn it. I'm so yeah. mad. <laughs> so, like, I first of all, we're losing Kenny. Second of all, you know, we just started this stuff and, you know. That's the other piece funny about this. So if you remember, Sean O'Neill was at the regiment. You know, I, I'm at, at a, I'm at B Co. You're at you're at A Co. Right? A Co. Right. You're, you're at you're at A Co. And um, I forget who was at C Co. at the time. It was Quisenberry. What was it? Q? Quisenberry. Right. Yeah. Yep. And so if you remember during that time oh, at, at crew, the Rangers, man. we um, they were going to move me to the regiment and put Sean at the battalion because I had been at the company for so long. And they're like, hey, let's, let's switch them out. And so so if you recall, so they do that, they do that doggone switch. And then when this, you know, a couple of weeks later, this thing kicks off and the company says, Biko says, hey, we want Kenny back because he had, you know, he had been here so long. But Sean gets to jump. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Sean jumps. Yeah, yeah. And, I, right. and so yeah. I always, you know, make fun of Sean. I'm like, man, you, you should give me half that star. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. <laughs> because you, you were the doggone battalion guy. And the battalion said, let's bring Kenny back because we're, you know, we're used to him because he's he's been here for, you know, yep. the, you know, three plus years. So I always laughed about that. So yeah, Sean got a, a you know, a piece of his star belongs to me. It should be a half yeah. star. <laughs> <laughs> he owes it to you. Yeah. So, so but that's funny. Well, that's funny you say that because um, we were talking about how the way we did things back there at at the Rangers, it was like it wasn't a matter of who am I going to get, you know, which JTAC will I get? It was like, no, I have my JTAC. It's Kenny Lindsay, and why is he not going with me? To you know, I want him. He's the guy I've worked with for all this time. He scored away. Yeah. Um, Which you don't, for whatever reason, it doesn't always work that way at other units, you know. And I think if I don't know if it were it could work, but I just know when we did it, you were so I guess ingrained with that with that unit. They that was you were part of the unit, I guess. That's right. Yes. Yeah. No, you're exactly right. Yeah. And even to the point, even if if you had to go to B core, I had to go to A core. They're like, yeah, you can. I know you, but man, we really want JD. Right. You know, for they, sure. They were used to us. They knew our tendencies. You know, they knew yeah. our attitude. So yeah. So yeah, you're you're spot on with that. Yeah. Like one time I had to support Seco. And it was kind of like that. It was like, um, oh, I, yeah, I've, I think I've seen you around at ACO, but, you know, and I had to like prove myself. And I'm like, no, I swear I'm not, I'm not sure, you know. Um, but yeah, it's, it's it, even, even changing company was kind of weird. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so get, I get back, I want to say about two weeks before you guys. And mm-hmm. I'm, I'm PCS and like, you know, three weeks later, you know, PCS right. to the 25th in Hawaii. So, and, and then there, do you remember we did try to, you all requested that I um, come back to support some, some of the missions into Iraq. And yeah. so I actually came TDY to Fort Benning for about a week. And then the 25th is like, no, <laughs> we, we're not going to let him stay out there. So. Yeah. I mean, and that it's a testament to how you were, man. I mean, it was like, we, regardless of who we have right now, we know Kenny's a, a known, he's a known commodity. He, we know he knows what he's doing. We're going to war. You know, the, we need to get guys that are scored away who already, who have already done the mission. Yeah. Um, yeah. But 25th said no, huh? They said, oh, yeah. They're like, yeah. Hey, they let me go TDY, but after that, they're like, yeah, when, yeah, you can't go and <laughs> deploy with them. Got, and then what it was, they said, you got to get our guys ready to deploy. For they, sure. I mean, and that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, yeah. that's, that's valid, you know. Yeah. yeah selfish, kind of going back to that selfish thing. Selfish. Like, we all were like, yeah, I want to do this. But then you got to think about the guys that you're yeah. actually in charge of, you know, and they're like, what about us? <laughs> and <laughs> speaking of that, speaking of the 25th, I mean, that's always been a traditionally a pretty good unit. Mm-hmm. Um, but the guys that I talked to who were under you at the 25th have nothing but good stuff to say about you. And then they're like, you kind of like what I was saying. I mean, everybody in it, it's a testament to you. Every, every place you go, everybody you work with, you have a, have a firsthand effect on them being better than they were. I mean, it's always in like with, with me and even with Q and uh, the guys at the 25th, everybody says the same thing about you, about you being, you know, a good leader and a good, you're, first of all, you said the best example going back to third bat the best thing i liked about you was that yeah you were over us but you were like also you didn't i don't want to say a buddy but you were a buddy you know you were like you were cool to us it wasn't you know you could have been like a hard ass and been like just do what i say or whatever but you were like you look you were like 
you looked out for us and you you tried to help us. And it was, I, I just can't thank you enough for like not being, uh, you know, just, um, just a boss, but you yeah. were like, yeah. you know, you were, you helped, you looked out for us. You, you mentored us. You, you told me, like, I remember, like I said, uh, there's a couple of times I had some hiccups in there and, um, and, uh, you were, you talked me through it and you were like, this is, you know, and you, you like a man to man, it wasn't like a boss yeah. to a, you know, and I really appreciated that. And that, that brings up another thing. I remember, um, when we used to do those competitions together, <laughs> we kind of glossed over that. We forgot about it, but man, that was, uh, that was one of the best times I ever had. And I, I still think, I still, uh, think we could have won that thing if we did. Uh, I don't know what, was it the navigation that we got jacked up on? We found like, one yeah, point I, think or, I think it was a nav. Yeah. I, I, we were crushing man. And then. You remember you your your heel got all messed up. Oh God! I, I'm just talking about that the other day at work. We we're talking about boots, and my my whole back end of my heel just came off like this big chunk of meat. Oh, that was because I was just trying to keep up with you. We, okay, for those who don't know, we do these competitions like the tech B competitions, and then this one particular one we had talked them into doing it kind of like a an Edry. So you did like three days in the field, and you do like you know three or four road marches, and you walked everywhere. And Kenny is a, a physical specimen and JD is like this dummy who's just trying to keep up. And he ran me in the ground and my heel just like and my feet were just hamburger. And my yeah, my heel just had a big chunk just come off of it. It's so gross. It is funny. I, I didn't feel sorry for you until after I saw your heel. I'm like, OK, that's, <laughs> that's legit. <laughs> yeah. You're like, come on, let's go. You just kept yelling at me. But it was legit. I mean, but I, I, but that's a testament to you, like motivating me. And like, I was like, yeah, all right, let's do it. You know, I mean, if it had been anybody else, I probably would have just said, forget it. I'm not going to do it. But number one, I couldn't let you down. And number two, you know, I, I, I thought we had a chance to win too. So yeah. I was like, come on, let's do it. Yeah. But yeah. I was, uh, I was, uh, I was hurting. So I think we're the 25th ASOS, right? Yeah. 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 25th. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Go ahead. It, a uh, really, really good assignment. A lot of, I mean, Good, good guys in, in that organization. Yeah, you know, yeah. Luckily, I was coming out of Fort Fort Benning, so um, had some clout right when I showed up to the to the organization. So I didn't have to go in and you know let me prove myself and let me tell you sure. where I am. You know, some people knew, so it made it easy. Um, the, the guys that stood out to me there, so Eric Ballister, Ballister's mm -hmm. a you know went on to be a combat controller. You know, still does great things. He's out the military now, but does great things. Um, Brian Reynolds, we called him Burt Reynolds. Yep, yep. Glenn Wilderman, just I, I had a, a, a solid crew. And what I remember about that crew, especially when you talk about um, supervising, I, I had to supervise um, that crew. But it's one of those things where you have good people, you know, sure. and what, what I recall going to that organization. So I'm the I'm the flight into RC, And I want to say we had I think we had about, you know, anywhere from 15 to 20 people in the flight. And we had issues between the airmen and the NCOs and within the flight in general. And they didn't like the previous NQRC, just all kinds of stuff. Yeah. And what I remember doing is as I separated all the, the airmen from the NCOs to just say, hey, what's what's going on? Tell me, you know, some of your issues and, and you know problems and things like that. And really what it got down to, J.D., was I told the flight. I said, whatever goes on in this flight stays in this flight. I don't care about anything else outside the organization. We're going to support the the um, squadron, of course, but I want us to look inward. Uh, you know, if if you know um, third brigade's doing X Y Z, I don't care. All I right. care about is what's going on in the second brigade. And what, what I what I picked up on as well is is our um, our flight commander. At the time, it was one of the relationships where, hey, call me with my call sign. And, and so we had airmen calling him by his call sign, just walking to the office. Hey, can you review my EPR? Can you look at my decoration? And so I went and talked to him and the assistant flight um, commander. And I said, all right, we got to talk. I said, hey, here's what I need from you. And here's what I'll do for you. And what, what I really told them is about, um, you know, airmen can't, NCO can't just walk into your office and, you know, ask you to do X, Y, Z. If they come in here, you need to say, go talk to Sergeant Lindsay. I said, I want to force the, the chain of command. So man, both of them, they they um locked onto that. I told the NCOs, I told the airmen, this is this is the chain of command, this is how we're gonna operate. But my my goal for the flight was to be the best flight in the organization. I said, I want to be the best flight, I want to be the go-to flight in the organization, and this is how we're gonna do it. And so really laid out a, a map of how we're gonna do it. People bought into it and things like that. I had one um one airman who we really two that outshined everybody. Yeah. And so so this airman was the type where 
if people couldn't, you know, PT to his level, if people weren't as squared away as he was, he would just leave you. Like, I'm, I'm out on my own. And, and so because I could see the, the good in the individual, I said, listen, I said, this is what I need from you. I said, we know by far who our worst airman is. I mean, it was right. it was evident, even to the point when I got there, we would kind of oust him. You know, you, on your island, going to do whatever you do. You're, you're not us I'm almost him. Mm -hmm. mindset. And, I, and so I told this airman that was really squared away. I said, if you want to be successful in this flight, I said, I want you to hook on to that airman over there. And I said, I want you to make him the best airman that he can be, knowing that the best he may ever be is average. But right now, he's not average. He doesn't represent the flight. And I'm going to put it on you to, you know, make that airman better. Nice. And initially he was like, ooh, not, you know, not really sure. Blah, blah, blah. And, and so, you know, we, we had discussions, man. Sure enough, it got to the point where and it's, this is probably the span of about six to eight months where this airman who was subpar, he had got to the point from a confident perspective where we had to pull him back. Nice. <laughs> it's like, dude, no, no, no. Come here. Wait a minute. Don't, don't. It's too motivated now. Yeah. Yeah. But but it, but it was really good. You know, um. Just, just a good environment. They they understood where my where my mind was. You know, it was to a point of, you know, honesty. I said, hey, if if you have to go to Hickam because you have an appointment because we're on Wheeler, you know, if you have to go to Hickam, you know, to have an appointment or something like that. If you got an appointment, tell me you have an appointment. If you're done with your work and we've talked about, you know, what you need to do for the week and you just want to go home, you know, early. I said, tell me that. Yeah. And th that way I can talk to the op soup and everyone else and tell when they ask about where's so-and-so at, I can tell them. And then I'll take the brunt of, Hey, Kenny, don't do that anymore. I said, yeah. but you can't lie to me. You can't say I'm going to the, Hey, I got an appointment at the hospital with my wife and you're at the house. Yeah. And, right. <laughs> and, and so, um, man, they, they all bought completely into that. So there was transparency. There was, um, there was honesty. We, we, and that trust, I mean, that just builds yeah. that trust between you guys. That Yeah, yeah. We, we had a chip on our shoulder, but it was a good chip. And then over, over the course of about, you know, nine months to a year, easily we were the best flight in that squadron. I mean, to nice. the point, you know, we're the ones who are, you know, going for the, the news articles, you know, hey, you got the commander coming down, you know, um, B flight, I need you to go and, and train and show and, and stuff like that. So just just a really, a really good flight. Nice. Yeah. Right on. We're going from from special ops to convention on that as you bounce back around. A lot of times we get in special ops and we want to stay there. Yeah. And um, you know, not I'm definitely not pointing fingers at anyone for wanting to do that. I just I think we have more value when you go back conventional, where you're not trying to teach somebody how to be a special operator, uh -huh. but you just give them techniques and things to make them better. For sure. You know, yeah, I think there's a lot of us that didn't ever want to go back, but mm -hmm. the, but but everybody that did brought something like you just said, like brought a, a lot to the table. You know, yeah. like hey, this is the way we did it there. It's worked. It's you know, I suggest you do it this way. And it, I think a lot of people, I think it helped out the crew. Field. I mean, obviously it did with those guys from the 25th when you went back. And then so. the story behind this is why they do it that way. Sure, sure. Make, make it make sense. It's like okay, I got it. Yeah. Yeah, not just like do it because I because we did it over there. Like, I came from there and it's good, just do it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That never works. Uh so how how long were we at the 25th? Uh, so 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 we got hit with stop loss at the 25th or stop right. move, stop move. So Angie right. did, so which made us stay there for almost five years. Ended wow. up being like just, just over four and a half. So I and just to tell you how long we were there, I went from tech sergeant to senior master sergeant at the 20th. Really? Yeah, so in this four you wow. know, half month month window, you know, one because of the um the stop move, and we got hit with stop moves because the twenty fifth first deployment to to Iraq was in January of two thousand four. Okay, and so at the time I'm the flight into I see go to um go to Iraq. At the time, Angie was not supposed to deploy. Okay, well in March, Angie gets hit with a hey, you got to go to Afghanistan. And so, you know, of course, you know, she has to get the child care plan together and, and get the kids back to Alabama. So she ends up deploying. She's in Afghanistan. I'm in Iraq. And then when I'm about to come back, which is I was going to come back in August, early August. Our organization is now also going to Afghanistan. OK. And so and so the, the op soup was going to deploy. And so I tell the op soup, I'm like, hey, I said, there's no sense in me coming back to Hawaii because Angie's, you know, in Afghanistan. I need to just go to Afghanistan, too, because I can't have the kids on island because we, you know, you go TDY too much. Sure, sure. And so they, they had to do some waivers and stuff like that. You know, they have that policy of the one to one and you got to get waivers and all that. So they end up getting a waiver for me where I was going to come back in you know, August 
from Iraq. I ended up staying in Hawaii for right about a month. And then I go, I went to, um, to Afghanistan. Okay. And then just so happens, Angie and I, are, we're, we're on Bagram, but now I'm the, I'm the op suit for the 25th um, at Bagram. Nice. And then so, so her and I are, are, are together and um, I stayed there until April of 2005. Okay. Yeah. And then she Did, comes back a couple months after. When you were in Iraq or Afghanistan that during with the 25th, what, what were you guys doing over there? What kind of missions were you guys doing? Um, for Iraq, we were in, when you, you start in, I forget the, the name of the Camp Richardson or whatever the name of it is, but there with the convoy up to, um, to Kirkuk is where I was at. Okay. And um, so this is the time when, when, the IEDs are starting to get very prevalent where you're seeing them all over the battlefield. And what was, what stuck out to me for that deployment was we had just gotten a bunch of up armored Humvees, just the air force guys, the army guys didn't have them yet. They were still run, you know, have, having the soft ones. And at the time I thought, Oh, we got an up armored Humvee. We're good. Nothing can happen. That's we're in up armor. And, you know, of course that, that's, that's so far from the doggone truth. It's not funny. Right. So, um, so sure enough, we convoy, we convoy to um, going up to Kirkuk, get, you know, somewhere in the convoy gets hit by IED. And at the time I have F-15s that are um, on station. So and, and this is really when, when you talk about being at, a, at a, a large conventional unit who knows that I got a JTAC who supports me, but they had they really don't know you, you know, and things like that. Of course, when yeah. something kicks off like that, now I know who the JTAC is. <laughs> yeah. So, so we're on the road, you know, ID, you know, up we all get our vehicles and start, you know, pulling security and JD, by the time I'm on a knee, I have these F-15 screaming down our convoy. I mean, they're, they're low, they're fast and they're loud. And, and nice. they, they go the entire um, length of the convoy. They go up and they get in the wheel and they're just, they're just up there just orbiting. Yeah. I must've had like 10 army Joes are like, are you talking to them? Like, <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> You know, and it's like, you know, they had them looking at stuff. We didn't, they didn't drop any bombs or anything, but just that, you know, that comfort of, hey man, they're overhead and everybody hears it and everybody knows it. That's what I was going to say. It's, it's, it's the the feeling of security having that aircraft right. overhead is like, yeah. It, yeah. yeah. You, you can't describe so it. Funny. I, I couldn't have, I couldn't have um, set up timing better. And we, on all of our convoys, we all had aircraft that were, you know, supporting the actual movement. Nice. But just the, you know, they must have been in the right term, you know, when I, when I got on the mic or they, they had to start dropping right then because it was within it was within probably 30 seconds when they, you know, buzzed our dang um, our convoy, and, you know, got up. It's like, oh, yeah, Dude, for all we know, that that low show could have uh, prevented a, an, an ambush. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, who knows what we could have on, happen. you know, we thought it we thought it would be an ambush, you know. And, yeah. 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 I mean, they, they, they could have been like, mm, let's. On second thought, let's not attack these guys right now. <laughs> we got a vehicle. That's good enough. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, That's man. We, yes, we were talking we about to get up to Kirkuk. And, and at the time, we were doing some of the um, we, we were going out, meeting with the locals, you know, really where we're trying to. Um, I forget what you call this whole partnership cooperation. Hey, you know, we're, we're the good guys, you know, we, we want to, you know, be a part of the team and we were replacing the 173rd. So Lunk and those guys. Okay. Yeah. They, they were the ones who were up there. So we we're replacing them. So a lot of partnership type things, some, you know, getting monies for you know, building stuff, but no, um, really not a whole lot of conflict. We, we were getting rocketed almost every dang night though. You know, the rockets would come in, but you're in the city. So you don't, you don't do anything except you sure. launch. There was, the um, Kirkuk is actually, you know, it was an active um, airfield that we had F-16s there at one point, had A-10s at one point. So every time they, they would, you know, launch rockets, we would get aircraft up and we'd control them and try to find out where the um, launch point was. And then we would send a QRF, you know, out to that point. But normally when you got there, everything's gone. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, so, so that, that yeah. went on for six months. <laughs> That's the thing. It's like by the time you get up there, they're either gone or it was on a timer or it's, you know, remote detonated or something, you know, remote launched. So, yeah, it's just more harassment. It, it, did you did anybody suffer any casualties in any rocket attacks or yeah, anything? Or? I mean, um, I think the rocket attacks, maybe some civilians. I mean, because Cook was pretty you know big and spread out. So they're just doing the pot shots there. There was a situation though where we had a, um, a soldier with a checkpoint set up. And I, um, a VBID, you know, oh, um, detonated. And this, this soldier was not, he was actually on break. You know, he wasn't at, at the line, but he was sitting in a Humvee 
with his um one of his legs were hanging out the door and it was an up armored Humvee and when the blast went it it shut the door and it it uh, oh. amputated his leg. So he ended up um, we'll get him back to cook, but he ended up passing away. Oh my gosh. Yeah. He, oh. a, you know, I, I, matter of fact, I forgot you sent me this picture. There was a, a friend of mine, they were doing a meeting with some of the um the government folks in, in town and um it was an IED that exploded. But this this friend of mine, he took a bunch of the um the shrapnel on the side of his head and his neck and his helmet and stuff like that. But I actually, I never, they brought his helmet back, never saw him again. He didn't, he didn't pass away, but I I never linked up with him again. Oh, really? But just a a bloodied helmet and stuff. And you're like, good Lord, you know, and then you could, you could actually see where the, um, the Kevlar, you know, went against the, um, whatever hit his helmet, you know, it's like he exploded. So um, yeah, yeah. yeah, I don't, I don't know what all happened to him. I know he took some shrapnel on his neck and stuff like that, but he did live. Oh, nice. Yeah. And you just you haven't talked to him since then. Never just no. lost touch with him. Huh? No. Yep. They, Isn't they, it weird I, how like you can share that kind of like um, that extreme experience with a guy, and then you go your separate ways, and it's it's almost hard to even figure out where to even start to look for the guy. You know, sometimes. Yeah. 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 No, they evacuated him and just never never saw him again. Huh. Here's a funny thing about Kirkuk as well. So I sent you a picture that has me and an army guy standing by a Humvee. Um, mm-hmm. So I so I so we knew him. Uh, him and Angie's wife were both chaplain assistants. So they worked together. Me and him knew each other through our wives. So, so we, you know, rode together in Hawaii. So that guy now lives about 400 meters from me. Oh, really? <laughs> he lives right on the corner. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? It is. And probably not by design. It, it was just oh, not was at all. like a fluke, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because exactly. <laughs> So how was it uh, in Afghanistan with Angie? Was that pretty cool? Yeah, so so Afghanistan was a little bit um, was a little bit different because I was the the ops into IC for or yeah for the was for the squadron. I was the ops superintendent, so I'm um, really just managing our guys who were who were out at the fobs and things like that. It was just it was a whole bunch of just managing um, yeah, the yeah. techies that were out, but that yeah, uneventful. Yeah, it was uneventful. do you ever do any uh, like visits out there? I'm, yeah, I'm yeah, I would go and just check on guys, but even even then, it was just—I mean, there was during that time for some reason not a whole lot of you know was going on with regards to drops, and I think that's because the the ROE became so restrictive on on when you can drop a bomb. Where it, I mean, it almost took general yeah. officer approval to you know for you to say clear it hot. Yep, and, and that that was some of our guys' frustrations. What hey, I can we. We, we, we can see it. We got positive ID and, you know, but I still have to get these different levels of approval before I can do anything. Right. Yeah, that was, that was a definitely a point of our frustration for the 25th guys, especially in the um, 04, 05 timeframe. It almost seemed like the, the leadership had such a, you know, with ISR and, and just mm-hmm. so much connectivity with the battlefield, they took away all that power from the ground commander. It's like, well, there's a guy there that his whole job is to make these decisions. You know, we don't need to call back and ask for permission. It's like, well, no, you do. Cause we have eyes on and we can see it's like, but they don't really have SA. That's right. So, you know, I mean, it's the thing with, you know, with with all your different feeds, you were getting, everyone can see what's going on. And so now everybody's, you can hear all the transmissions and wait wait a minute. You know, are we sure? What about this? And then all that stuff going back and forth there. I can't do anything. I'm sorry. Yeah. (laughs) I know. So, so you're the 25th, and then uh, you made senior the 25th. Yeah, I made senior the 25th, so and, it, and it's time for us now to PCS. And because we were split up from the kids, really in, in total, 16 months, we're away from wow. the kids. Um, My goodness. And Angie says, and this is where, you know, what I said, we, we talked about, hey, next assignments, we got we to gotta talk it out. It can't be just me. But So Angie says, all right, she says, um, I'm going to pull my package for Master Sergeant, which is E8 for the Army. She's mm-hmm. like, for my package, I don't want to compete. We can never deploy like this again. You know, not, not right. both of us, you know, not the kids. It's too much on the family. And she knew that if she made her E8, that then she would go to a division. And of course, the divisions are all on cycle. So we know they're going to deploy. Yeah. So, um, so she makes that decision. I'm like, okay, where can you go? And you don't have to deploy. She says, I can go to Fort Jackson, South Carolina. And I'm like, Man, that, that sounds like Shire Force Base to me. <laughs> so, um, so sure enough, that that does mean Shaw. So, so when I when I say, hey, I want to go ahead and, and go to Shaw, of course, the career is like, really, are you sure? Yeah. And, and you want to go to Shaw? I, I need to go to Shaw. I really need to go to Shaw. <laughs> so, um, just so happens, Bob Hicks was was retiring. He was a senior there, 
and it, it, it made sense. So it was, it was smooth for me. Talk. And what Angie had said is she said, let me, let me do my time at the, the schoolhouses at Fort Jackson. She said, let mm -hmm. me do the schoolhouse. I can't deploy from there. I'll retire after that job and then I'll follow you wherever we have to go. Nice. So, yeah. So, so it makes sense. So, you know, go to Shaw, I get two deployments actually out of Shaw, but I make chief out of Shaw and then go back to the 14th. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you took out, you were the, um, the superintendent of the 14th. Yeah. You get back. Hold well, on. well, the superintendent at the ASOC as well. So at the six, oh, okay. what is it? Man, I forget the number. 682nd, I want to say. Yeah, 682nd. Is that what it is? The superintendent there and then, you know, make chief and then go to, go to Bragg. I will tell you what was funny. So when I was at the, when I was at the 682nd, I deployed to Afghanistan and they throw me on some, I'm on a QRF and, and maybe I have my years. I think it's, oh, I think it's, oh, you know what? No, 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 no. I'm wrong. This is back when Angie and I were deployed together. I'm on a QRF for the first um, presidential election in Afghanistan. Oh, so, so they make me <laughs> uh, I'm the I'm the JTAC that's in support of the presidential security. So, wow. so then, you know, Karzai. Yeah. yeah. So every once a week, man, we would do this QRF where we'd go and hop on helicopters. We'd fly down to Kabul. We would land you know, on his compound and we would just set up, you know, everything, do security, talk to aircraft and all those things. All like, the whole thing is about protecting him, you know, yeah, when, yeah. when the um election was going to happen so for the election of course we go on there we we stay you know on the compound and we're just monitoring everything that's going on of course as you know un uneventful but um but it was it was pretty dang neat to just you know when, when we think about united states and presidential compound it's like yeah, yeah, yeah you think about presidential compound there it's like all right, all right yeah, it looks okay. like yes, yeah. somebody else's house yeah it's like a decent office or something, but okay. okay. Yeah, right, right. It, yeah, he had, you know, he had uh, just herds of security that were always around him, but we got to, you know, meet him, talk to him, shake his hand, you know, be right nice. there where he was at. And that, that was actually a, um, a joint team. I sent you a picture of that too. A Marine led the QRF, Marine major aviator guy. And then um, we had army guys, common, you know, people that were part of the package. I was the, um, the um, you know, fire support part of that package okay. but yeah every every week we'd go out there and, and do these qrfs to to gobble and we you know stay out there for a couple of days and come back so. you know i i always think you say it was uneventful but um i i always think like we rolled so heavy a lot that mm -hmm. i think people just got deterred by it they're just like eh, yeah. i'm not gonna you know what i mean like i think if you wouldn't have done that or if, i think or if there had been a smaller package you guys would have had it probably could have gone a different way but yeah man, we, like i said we just we were so intimidating sometimes where the, how, you know, just the U S presence in locations, they, I bet they really had to decide what they were going to attack and what they weren't. Cause yeah, I mean, no, I agree. Yeah, but yeah. So yeah, do that. Then, then that's the, you know, come back PCS to Shaw, you know, deployed a, as an ASOC person. Only thing we did out there was we, we, we pushed the MRT stuff, those ruggedized tablets. <laughs> that, was, that was a big thing, you know, when I was at the, at the, um, at the ASOC and, you know, we do, we did a bunch of the, the digital, you know, requests and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, make chief go to the 14th. And then from the 14th, I did deploy as the, um, the group superintendent. Um, what, I forget what the name of the group, the 368th. I think it's a 368. I, I, yeah, I I'm not sure. The deployed name. group, you mean? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, I forget the, the number of it, but I, it was there. And then we were, I was on, I was on BAP then there, there at victory. So, you know, just day to day monitoring all the the JTACs and stuff like that, and we do a bunch of you know fob hopping and going and checking on people and stuff. Right on. Yeah, coming from there, got got selected for for command chief out of the 14th. First um, command chief job was was um, seventh bomb wing, and that's when I told Angie, "Hey, I'm not deploying anymore. I'm good." Famous <laughs> last yeah. words. Oh my god! So <laughs> yeah, so I go there. I'm there for a, like 13 months. And the dog on the commander at the, you know, out at Bagram, he, or he's going to be the commander. He calls me up. All, it's like on a Saturday, I'm cutting grass. He's like, hey, Chief Lindsay. I'm like, yeah, hello. He's like, I'm, you know, he's Joe Malakowski. I'm General Malakowski. Blah, blah, blah. I'm going to be the commander out at the Ford, you know, Ford since, yeah, I think what it is. Out at Bagram, you know, or 455th, um, Expeditionary Wing at Bagram. He says, um, I want you to be my command chief. And I was like, no. No interview, no nothing. Is this, yeah, is this <laughs> you have a choice. Yeah, so I mean, so yeah, so really, no choice. He just he says, "I want you to be my command chief." And then what it was other 
officers that talk to him. This is a just you know this for guy, sure, yeah. Got experience there. And so yeah, man. So I'm cutting grass and I get done cutting grass and I'm like, now I have to go tell Angie that I'm deploying. And she's gonna be like, I thought you, you said just told her you weren't going yeah. anywhere. <laughs> oh man, I mean, not even you know, not even a year and two, I'm gonna go tell her I have to deploy. So sure enough, you know, I go in the house, like, hey, you're not gonna believe this. You know, call me up and now it's gonna be for a year. And she's like, I thought you said, I'm like, I know, I don't, I don't know how this command chief stuff. Oh, it was a year? You had to go for a year? It was a year. Yeah, it was a weird, oh. weird gig for the command chief. And I'm like, man. And so, yeah. And so, and then once you, when you PCS, you're no longer the command chief at the installation, but your your spouse stays there, your kids and everyone stays there. Sure, sure. So, um, so yeah, so sure enough, man, I deployed to, um, to Afghanistan in it's September of 13. Yeah, September 13. You don't know the job on, on the back side of that. And now, now I'm just a command chief there, just you know, taking care of a, a whole bunch of people, interacting with you know army counterparts and stuff like that. And so get done with that. Actually came back a couple of months early from that deployment because my mom passed away. Oh. Um yeah, so come back from that deployment and then we get orders to um to Nellis, you know, at the war. Okay. So my, my last deployment was the there's a point right there at um, at Bagram. You know, with the 455th as the command chief out there. Since you brought up your mom, I want to tell that story about, I don't know where we were going, but mm -hmm. we, this is way back. You, you know what I'm talking about. We talked about it at JT. <laughs> yeah. We were on a cast trip and uh, I can't, what was it? What was the situation? Like what, it, something got canceled or we were, we were in a location where we didn't have a whole lot to do. I can't remember what it was. Do you remember? What I, don't, the situation so was? I, don't, I don't know if we were at, at Shelby or what range we were at, or if we flew in, I think we, I thought we flew into New Orleans. I, I am just not a hundred percent sure, but we had to. The only reason to I think we were driving is because like we had to do, we had the ability to kind of just go where we wanted to, you know? And so I thought we had the flexibility, but we could have flown in too, but I thought we were all in a van or a big truck. And I, we were just like, well, what do we do now? I was like, well, <laughs> Kenny's houses are like right down there. Let's just go to his house. I, I bet you it was Shelby. Because when, okay. when I see the proximity of Shelby and New Makes Orleans, sense, yeah. Yeah, that, yeah, that's not too far away. But I, I, I definitely remember that. Yeah, that and, so and, awesome. and I'll tell you what's funny. So so um, she did that for us. But also when I was at the 25th, we um, we actually went to Shelby for a cash trip. And it was a bunch of us. It was probably yeah. 12 or 15 people. The exact same thing. I mean, she, she really, uh, you just loved you know, doing that for everyone, you know, she's going, you know, make breakfast, make dinner. My dad's going to be at work and, you know, you can lay where you want to lay and she doesn't care. Right. For yeah. It was just, it was just good. It was really good. Yeah. We, when we, you would think like if anybody else's house, you walk in the front door and their mom probably would have been like, really <laughs> what's going on. But here she was so friendly and so uh, loving and like just welcoming to everybody. And not only that, but like we sat down for dinner and it was like a, a friggin', uh, five course meal. I mean, it was like, she had everything, you know, like it was gumbo and a, yeah. uh, I, I man, I was like, what, what? she just whipped it up real quick or had it. Yeah. I don't know what it was, but she was, Oh man, it was so great. It was the best, that was yeah. the best dinner ever, man. That, no, that, oh. that was the standard for sure. Yeah. Your mom was, she was Even I, I'll tell you, man. JD, when I, when I think about my mom and how she was, I, I mean, I didn't think about this until she passed away, but, um, and I'll be honest, she's growing up in America. I think she was, she could see my joy in being in the career field, but I believe she was very thankful because the the company I kept cared about me. And I sure. think that was her way of saying thank you. Oh, well, well, we certainly did. And she, I mean, she certainly <laughs> said, thank you, man. That was, she, she was, I just remember she was so nice and so like, <laughs> you know, it was like, well, she treated us kind of like we were all her kids, you know, like yeah. it was like we were all she had. Yeah, man, it was so new. It was so cool. <laughs> OK, so, I, yeah, since you mentioned your mom, sorry, sorry about to hear about her passing. Um, she's a great, like, great lady. Um, but so you were at the um, you went to the 14th, you deployed for that year and then uh, you went to Nellis. So yeah. tell me about that. Like, what were you? You were a command chief there as well. Yeah, I was right? the, um, the warfare center command chief. So, okay. um, so at, at Nellis, once you and now command chief, just like really another job, you start kind of moving up to different levels of, of command chief where you get more responsibility. So when I, when I was at Nellis, there's a there are two other wings, really three wings that are on Nellis itself. So you got the air base wing, which has a command chief. You have the um, the 57th wing, you know, which is which is all the all the fighters and stuff that has a command chief. And then we had the uh, the 438th, which which was out at Creech. That had okay. A, chief and so just by and, and none of those command chiefs worked for me but by position i was the the lead command chief 
Okay. Just it's lots of interactions. There are any issues I would, you know, go to them and try to try to fix things really just on the base where you're looking at it from a, just a different perspective. Now, now my boss did um, evaluate all the commanders. Oh, okay. Because they, so, so they, they did report to him. So you kind of not in a roundabout way, you almost kind of were over those other. I could, I can influence some things for sure. Yeah, but okay. I think kind of like you said though, I never, I never saw myself as being truly over them. I mean, they're all Comanches. They've all been in the military, you know, twenty four. All kind of peers, yeah. Yeah, and it, it was more of that where, where it's more collaborative. Hey, what do you think about X? Or if if I saw something that was straight out wrong, I would just say, here's what I see, and this is what needs to be done. But um, typically, we would just have, you know, just we'd communicate and we would try to solve problems together as opposed to, you know, I'm in charge and what are we doing? And you need to right. me, you know, and even, well, you've, even always, awesome. you've always been that way. I mean, with us, I mean, you were like, hey, what can I do to help you? You know, yeah. this, you know, we you seem like you're struggling or you seem like you're, you know, what can I do for you? That was, yeah. that was you've always been that kind of a leader, which is I think that's the best kind of leader to be, because, I mean, at the end of the day, we're, you know, these leaders that become self-absorbed or self-important, it's like, well. Who's the real main effort? It's the guy on the ground. Right. Yeah. You know, it's so, you know, the, what we can do for them, that's that's the most important thing is helping the guy below you. Not they should they're not really there to to, to boost you up, I guess. Yeah. yeah. And I, I always try to keep that in my cross checks, even even today. I mean, I, I tell people now, do you know, when they meet me, and when I talk about things, there are some things I'm very passionate about. But I'm like, don't don't get it wrong. At any point in my day, I am cracking up inside about something. All right. <laughs> I, I am laughing about something you can almost guarantee it. Even when I'm serious, there's something that I'm I'm looking at that that's funny. You know, I, sure. I, I poke fun at myself. I, I know I'm not perfect. I know I have areas I can improve upon. And I think what that does for me, at least, is it, it keeps me balanced and aware of, hey, when I say certain things that you don't, you know, I'm not always right. And I realize it. And that's why it's important for me to get information from, you know, from other people just so I can sure. figure out where that where that happy medium is. And that's just, that's just how I am as a, as a person. And that just kind of transferred over into my military career. I'm, you know, treat, treat me, you know, I should treat people like I want to be treated, For but sure. I should respect everyone and, and never, never think based on your position that you're, you're that good or, or whatever the case is. That, that's never right. Good, actually. Yeah. Like you should be grateful that you were in that position. Right. Like that's, a, that's why I always looked at it. Like anytime I was like a flight into IC or the op soup or a superintendent, I was like, wow, thank you for, yeah, uh, allowing me to do this job. You know, I was real grateful instead of like, yeah, yeah I should you know, have this yeah, job. Somebody, you know? somebody put you there. You didn't, it right. wasn't based on, on your pedigree that, hey, you know, I'm going to, no, somebody, you know, either took a chance or something and said, hey, I'm going to put you in this position. I, I think my, um, my wing commander at Dias. So I thought I'd never be a command chief because I didn't have all the blocks checked that are supposed to be checked. Yeah. And I remember one day talking to, I was talking to the vice wing commander and he told me, he says, he says something. Di- there's something different about how you operate and the way you think about things, and um, just your your level of care. And he says, you know, what is it? And I, I said, I'll be honest with you. I said, I-, I think that when I was hired for this job, the wing commander took a chance on me. And I said, I realized that the wing commander took a chance on me, so I don't want to fail the wing commander. And and, and this is so, so now. This is this is Kenny talking to you from a personal perspective. And he says, what what do you mean that um, the wing commander? you know, took a chance on you. That's it. When I, when I look at everyone who competed for the position, everyone has a bachelor's degree. Everyone has group chief time. Everyone has been on air force installations running big programs. Mm-hmm. I said, I'm a, I'm a, a JTAC tac P with no group time. I've been on army installations, you know, predominantly my entire career. All right. I don't have a bachelor's degree. And then I told him, I said, and to be completely honest, I said, and I'm a black person. And I said, what I mean by that is I gave you every excuse or I gave him every excuse not to pick me. Yep. And I said, there's, there's nothing I could have said because I put myself in this situation. I said, yet he still, you know, selected me to be his command chief. So I feel like I'm indebted to him. And I said, yep. right, right or wrong. That's how I feel. Yeah. He's, he says, you know what? He says, I've never even, I never thought about it that way. I didn't see it. And I'm like, I, I get it. I understand it. But that's just, you know, internally, as you go through life and things happen, there are certain things that, that trigger you on, hmm, I, you know, I, I wonder. Yeah. Yeah. And well, I, I mean, I think it's a testament to you. I mean, you, like you, you've worked hard. I mean, it, it wasn't like uh, you, you skated through your career. I mean, you, you put in the work and 
and it's rec- I think people recognize that, you know, regardless of your queries, you got to fill, you know, yeah. those, uh, sometimes they're almost, um, arbitrary, you know, like, right. yeah. well, if we think you need this, it's like, well, why, you know what <laughs> I got a bachelor's degree in, uh, in, uh, sports and health sciences. What's that going to do for the military? You know, it's like, right. what, right. so, uh, but, but that, like I said, these realists, these guys that are actually real leaders can see a guy like you and be like, you know what? Yeah. We, they can put all the BS aside and be like, this is a leader. He knows what he's doing. He squared away. So, no, I think so. Yeah. So I I was very thankful to get that, that job. I initially didn't want it, you know, up front, but when I got, I'm like, man, I actually, I I can get into this. You know, I like what I'm doing. I like the reasons behind it. The why is really good. So, but I I did not think I was going to get picked for that job. Again, I, I, I'd almost, um, you know, had it to a situation where you've deleted yourself, you know, you're not for the job. Was that the, uh, was that the job you were like, uh, you didn't get dressed up and you just like, you're, you're just like, yeah, we'll see. Yeah, that, that, that is that job. That's even, that's even more of a testament to how good you are, man, because like you didn't even try. You're just like, and they got, I think he had in his mind, somebody, I mean, your reputation had preceded you obviously in that, in that situation. He, I think, I think that was just a formality to talk to you. Frankly, I think he probably had, he knew you were going to, he wanted you in the first place. So, but yeah, that was funny. You were yeah, like, I think, yeah, somebody may have talked because I didn't know him at all. So someone may have, have talked to him. But my whole yeah. thing was I got to I got to be real with him. So I got to show him yeah. you know, this, this is Kenny right here. You know, I, I can't I can't put on a suit. I can't you know dress up for you. This is me. And and this is what, what you have. And, yeah. you know, I think sometimes of that honesty is what people are looking for. Oh, for sure. Like I was going to say, that probably solidified that decision. And he's like, oh, this is the guy for sure. This is yeah. my guy. So, uh did you, where'd you go after Nellis? Did you go anywhere after Nellis or do you? Yeah, from Nellis, I, came, I came here. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah. I came here and I was the, um, the AFPC uh, command chief and you Oh my God. About, that's right. I can't believe yeah, I forgot yeah, about you, that. You yeah. talked about that's, this. How yeah. was that? It was, it was, that was different. And, but I, yeah. and I'll tell you, I, I'll tell anyone in the military this, you should probably do an AFPC tour early on in your command chief career. That way you understand how the air force, you know, works with regards to policies and things like that. But for me, it was it was um, so different. And you'll you'll definitely understand this so different because we look at policy as a guide, Mm -hmm. you know, but if I break policy, I'm not breaking a law. You know, I can't go to jail for it. It's just, hey, we got to deviate based on the situation. Sure. Whereas um, in in the personnel center, I mean, they they, they live and breed by, you know, what's in the policy. This is. These are the rules we have to follow because we have to think about, you know, things being um, fair and equitable and stuff like that. So, yeah. So many times I would I would start asking, you know, why are we doing something a certain way? And, and the answer, you know, became, well, because the policy says and then it, it got to a point where I figured out how to how to navigate policy is, OK, who wrote it? Yeah. You know, let, let's find out what the intent truly is, because they they would really look at black and white, you know, and, and then because the whole world can see the, the Air Force policies, it would be hard to defend. For sure. And so, you know, so many times we go back and, OK, who, who wrote this? What was the intent? Let's get another read. And a lot of it was just based on it doesn't make sense. Yeah. You know, in this situation, it doesn't make sense. So that was a that was a challenge. And, and I know I was a challenge for AFPC, you know, no doubt, because yeah. when you're used to doing something a certain way, you know, you, you don't want too much turmoil. And, you know, hey, we, we've done it this way and, and it wasn't an issue. Why is it an issue now? Right, right. No, but I, I could, I could definitely see some, some movement there. You know, where I, I've had the, the, um, or I had the chief of staff of the Air Force, his um, executive, you know, assistant reached out to me, you know, about a particular, you know, situation. And he's like, hey, I need you to look at this, and I'm like, oh, let me, you know, what's going on? Nice. We start once we start peeling it back. It's like, man, we like, you know, when I say we, our organization said no to a ask from, um, from the chief of staff. But it was a it was because of what policy said. And so I'm like, man, I said, you know, and that that's where, you know, it, it took me talking to some of our chiefs within the center and said, hey, we, we got to, you know, we got to look at these a little bit, you know, in more detail and just add some of our our own um, thought and experiences to it before we just say no, because the policy says. What a great set of eyes uh, you brought to the the whole thing, because, I mean, who knows who had that job before, you know, could have been guys that did personnel stuff their whole life. And they're like, well, this is the way we've always done it. But when you get in there doing what you've done and knowing what you know, you see it through a different lens. And I yeah. bet you could like be like, well, this doesn't really make sense. It may be back in the day it made sense for this reason, but now it's changed so much that, yeah, I'll bet you, yeah. you probably had a lot of good influence on 
just making some common sense changes, I guess, to yeah. policy. And really, that, that's, you know, seeing it from a different lens for sure. Some people say, yep, I see it. But then some people say, no, we don't don't see it that way. Don't, don't agree with it. And it, it is what it is. You know, I, I always think regardless if someone agrees with what you say, if you're in a position to where you can bring it up and just say, hey, this this is what I see, you do that. Yeah. You know, but you don't you're not to the point where I'm going to fall completely on my sport about this because I, I think it's, right. Right. it's the only way to be. No, you, you bring it up. You talk about it. You come up with, you know, whatever, you know, conclusion. And then you continue to move. Of course, if it's at a at a much higher level and, and you know, my boss is going to get in trouble. That's where I, I'd push and prod a little bit more. Like, no, we need to we need to look at this. Sure, sure. But some of them you just say, yeah, I got it. We, we can continue to move. We'll look at that later. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Not everything's worth uh, that's yeah, right. going to war, going to war over for sure. So yeah, good, good time there and ended up getting um, extended for a year. So, and that's why I went to 31 years. Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force asked me would I stay for an additional year because at the time my boss and I just really had synced um, together and we're doing some things within the Air Force that were positive. So he said, hey, I want you to stay one more year, you know, with your boss and then just, you know, just retire after that. So it, it made sense. We'd cool. all, yeah, we had bought land, we'd had our house built. So it all made sense. Oh, nice. Yeah, that you were, and I know there's a lot of some guys before you that went to that level. Um, you know, like Marty Klukas was at a higher level, and I think it's great to see guys like you or guys in the career field doing that kind of stuff. You know, it kind of it's a, it, it's uh, it's it. I don't want to say it keeps us relevant, but it 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 exposes us to the career to the rest of the Air Force. You know, like hey, wait, what was your career tech P? Oh, cool, and then you know, like it it exposes everyone to that we are out there and we are, we can do great things, you know? And, and you know, within the career field itself. So, so a lot of people frown on it, you know, like, yeah, I wouldn't do it. Cause they, you know, we will go with hey, your, you're a trader. Why would you do that? All that kind of stuff. But yeah, you know, I if know. you, I think anyone in the career field that actually does it, you, you'll see that the level of impact you have within the air force, even, even as a tack P though, you're not doing tack P stuff. It's tremendous. Sure. Because people want to know, why do you think a certain way, you know, what, what have you seen? And you can communicate with, with, um, higher levels of leadership and it always gets back to what do you do who are you and then once you get that stuff out you become you know a a proponent for the for the career field not right. hey, this is kind of what we do and, and leave us alone what, what it really taught me is how to how to navigate things within the air force so if i had if i was aware if i had like a command chief tac p who came back to you know a group level or squadron level say this is how the air force works in this particular situation now I'm armed with understanding how to how to get through certain things. And, you know, and then, then knowing that, hey, that's going to be a, a roadblock because that's not in anybody's strategy up at that level. You right, know, right. In their strategy and how do we make sure that we're in line with what, you know, they're saying? Right. Or, or how do I communicate what we need before they put it in a strategy? Yeah, you come out of left field with something that nobody's, nobody's even tracking. Yeah. You, know, you either got to figure out how to sell it or, or change it into this, some language they can understand yeah. or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. There's, there, there's, some, there's some good in, in getting to those levels and just having a different understanding. The, um, my biggest takeaway there is we, we struggled in the community with trying to make the bigger Air Force understand us and who we were. Right as opposed to us taking the time to understand the Air Force and see where we fit into the Air Force. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? And I think once, once you figure out where that fit really is and how it operates, now it's easy to be in and say, okay, this is where we're at and this is how we can influence these you know, decisions and conversations and that stuff. Yeah, we've always been real good as tech P's to play both sides of the fence at the lower levels. Yeah. Now we just have to figure out a way to do it at those higher levels. And then, yeah. Yeah, can I get what we want? Yeah. Well, cool. Hey, well, do you have, uh, so you retired out of there. Do you have any, um, like advice for anybody if, if they're, if they, um, are looking to get out or any advice, for, any leadership advice or anything that's like kind of stuck with you or, um, anything you want to impart to anybody before we, um, wrap this up? I think a military person with regards to getting out, well, a couple of things, especially for a younger um, military tag peer, military person, um, whether you retire or whether you get out in four years, 10 years, whatever the case may be, um, try to identify what you want in life post-military. You know, so if you're yeah. if you're married, if you have kids, if you have a family, it, 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 you know, hey, do I want to be in, in a rocking chair with my family intact? Or is that not really important because I want to go off and explore 
you know, these types of things. You got to figure that, that out while you're in the military, because that should drive some of the things that you do when you're in the military. If if you don't have a family and you have aspirations to do something different, get as many certifications, qualifications you can while you're in the military. So you're prepared when you get out of the military. Yeah. And, you know, the, the thing about our career field, a lot of times it leads you to, to work for companies where you're, you know, in charge of, you know, you're, you're selling, you know, radios, you're, you're doing things that are, that are known around the career field. And then you go back and you see guys who who you were in the career field with, if that's your aspirations, that's, that's a little bit easier to, to follow suit because there's so many people that are doing it where you can get, you know, get connected and, 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 you know, go on and move on that. For, for me, I wanted to go a different direction. So I wanted something completely different. I want to understand what goes on in, in society, what goes on in large corporations, really just for the exposure to say, OK, I, I get it. I understand it. Whether I like it or not, I, I don't know. You know, yet even today, I don't know if I like it or not. But I do like the fact that I'm, I'm expanding myself to try things different. Sure. You know, in, in the company that I'm in right now, I'm um, as of this year, I'm now the director of employee experience. And that's something that, that I've really wanted to do based on civilians looking at my military career and saying, hey, you got a passion for for this right here. This is what you should be doing. So yeah. we didn't have that position in the company, you know, communicated back and forth for you know a couple of months. And then our CEO said, yeah, you know, I, I think this is good. This is something we need. So they you know, put me in that position the start of this year. So that's what I'm doing now. And it's truly what I what I want to do. You know, nice. what five, 10 years down the road, I'm not sure if I'll still be wanting to do it right now. Right now, it fits me. And then the, the, the other piece. So when we were about to retire, our thing was where are we going to live, you know, house, all this stuff. And we wanted everything to be perfect. I mean, to the yeah. point, you know, if we buy land, it has to be, you know, this grade of doggone slope, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> right. Everything had to be perfect. And, and then for Angie and I, what we, you know, came to grips with is if we want to move, we can just move. We don't, everything doesn't have to be perfect. You know, right. right now this works for us. So let's live here now. If we got to move in 10 years, let's move in 10 years. And that took a lot of pressure off of us with regards to, you know, finding out where we're going to stay and what our house is going to look like and all, all that kind of stuff. So, um, so understand when you retire, it doesn't mean retired and I'm here and this is it. You know, I'm going yeah, yeah. to grow roots and I'm not ever moving again because, you know, things in, in life happen and, and change and stuff like that. So don't, so don't get grounded to I have to be in this one spot because this is what retirement means because it actually doesn't mean that. So the, um, the preparation, you know, prepare to leave the military really sooner than later. If you're going to leave five years from now, prepare now. You know, you're just setting yourself up for success. Um, sure. If you don't know exactly what you want to do, get more certificates, you know, so, so you have options as you yeah. kind of go, go forward, you know, in life. And then the, the last piece is, is what do you want at the end? For, for us, I want it, you know, still to have a relationship with our kids and I want it to be with Angie. You know, yeah. and, and then whatever happens, you know, beyond that, it just happens. It keeps it pretty simple. Like and, and yeah. like you said, it, it, if you just if you have those simple goals and you have the qualifications and the sky's the limit, then you can just, you know, another pressure. I'm going to share one last story with you and I'm going to call it good. So okay. um, so I sent you a picture of this guy I put pops on there. Yeah. So um, so that that's my he's my granddad. He's actually he's my he's my step granddad, but he's the only granddad I know because. When I was born, him and my grandma were already married. Okay. So, um, so Pops back in 2020, he was the oldest living World War II veteran. So he was on the cover of the, this Time magazine. My, um, my granddaughter saw the magazine at our house and she goes and reads it and, hey, you know, who is this? And what's going on with this guy? And tell them to go, hey, go, go ask your, you're our mom. And so Dana said, oh, that's your, you know, that, that's your grand, that's your great granddad. And she's like, I don't, I don't understand. Mm-hmm. And then fast forward, we go, we go to see Pop in New Orleans in August of 2020. So it's during COVID and all that stuff. It's really so our granddaughter can interact with him. He's he's a hundred years older than she is. And you know, when they have this this conversation and we record them or her talking to him. And it it'll it, it'll build me the rest of my life what he told her because at the time I, I wasn't even in the mindset to think this is what he would say. But she asked him what um what advice would you give a person my age? You know, so, so a hundred and, and 10 year old man. Yeah. What advice would you give me a, a 10 year old girl? And all he said was be nice to people. And I'm taught, and I, I, and when he said it, I'm like, man, something so doggone simple, be nice to people. 
but he's talking about being nice to people because he was born in you know 1909. Right. You know, so so that has a whole different perspective and meaning to him when he says be nice to people. So, you know, so I took the opportunity once we got back to Texas and I talked to her. I said, let me tell you what that really means for him when he says be nice to people. And he, even for me, that gave me a different perspective on, on what, you know, what being nice really means. Mm -hmm. You know, if I if I sit here and, and whine about I'm struggling right now or things aren't right, you know, this is so bad. If I go back, you know, to that point, then not only were things, you know, bad and terrible, he couldn't do anything to change it. Right. It was just it was how it day. Hey, this is how it is. You, you got to live like this until, you know, things change, you know, along the way. But that and that, that so out of, you know, a 110 year old guy, that's what he had. That's the advice he gives her. Be nice to people. Just be nice to people. Man, that's so that's so powerful. I mean, because, I mean, in, in his life a lot of people were probably not nice to him. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, if yeah. You're in, like sure. and not, and that's kind of like understating it. You know what I yeah. mean? He, he is, he lived through all those times when it was really rough. And, uh, and it, it's that something so simple can be so powerful though. You yeah. Know, just, just be nice to people. That's all you gotta. Yeah. I love that story. Uh, yeah. I'm going to, um, I want to post that. If you're if you're okay with it, I want yeah. to post that picture in yeah. your when I push your bio and all that stuff. I'd like to put that on there if that's okay. Okay, yeah, that's fine. Um, if not, I can't. I mean, it's be, I just oh, think that's uh, I think that's um, I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, that you, oh, that's you, fine. Well, I don't take. I know you said an hour and a half. We've already hit two hours, so <laughs> I don't want to take up much more of your time. But I mean, I I really can't thank you enough for doing this. I, like I said, no, you, you uh, had a huge, uh, probably more than you even know. You had a huge influence on me in my career, and I wouldn't have been. I wouldn't have been anywhere in my career without, without my interactions with you. So I just want to thank you. And uh, I, I appreciate you being cool and like putting up with me and like mentoring me, you know, it just, it was invaluable. So I, I just, just, thanks, man. I appreciate it. No, no, I, I appreciate you more than I can say, you know, we don't, we don't talk really. We don't talk. I mean, every night yeah. there's, a, there's a text or something that goes out, but, and, and that's, that's a part of me. That's, that's just how I am. I don't, I don't talk to, to a lot of people all the time. But um, that does not mean the love's not there. Same here. Same here. Okay. All right, man. Well, uh, thanks again. And uh, I'll uh, text you uh, more often. All right. <laughs> hey, I, make, make me do the same, though. Okay, I will. All right, J.D. All right, Kenny. All right, I'll see you later. You. All right. Bye. Bye.